Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us and um, hope you enjoyed the, the breakout rooms. Um, and welcome. My name is Graham Sucha. I'm uh, the Community Outreach Specialist at Cybera. I'm going to MC the first ever Alberta Rural Connectivity Forum. And so before we begin, uh, I would like to take this time to acknowledge the Indigenous people of all the lands that we are on today. From far, all corners of this province, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. While we meet here today on a virtual platform, myself from the traditional territory of Treaty 7, as well as Métis Region 3, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of reconciliation and collaboration. We do, this, we do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibilities in improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of our local Indigenous peoples and their culture. Before I begin, a couple housekeeping announcements. If you are having any connectivity challenges, we invite you to join us through the uh, Zoom phone info link that you have, or that was sent to you. Another option that you have is we are streaming this on Facebook Live, so you can go to Cybera's Facebook page and uh, stream from there if you run into any issues. Uh, I'm also gonna ask uh, so that we can all support those who are dealing with uh, low bandwidth or connectivity challenges uh, or restrictive internet plans that we turn our cameras off unless you're in the breakout rooms to help support those who are streaming in. Um, and if, uh, if you have any issues, uh, feel free to email us at info at cybera.ca. I would like to take this time to first thank all the members of the Alberta Rural Connectivity Coalition who helped put this together. Uh, this includes, but is not limited to, the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, RMA, Rural Development Network, Lakeland College, Southern Alberta's Sustainable Communities Initiative, Grand Yellowhead Public School Division, the Rural Economic Alliance of Alberta, and all of their members, Athabasca University and IBI. And I apologize if I've missed a few people. We've had a lot of traction with the coalition as it's launched, and, uh, and so we have a lot of people who've been signing up. Um, before, uh, before we jump to our first panelist, um, as many of you may know, the Ministry of Service Alberta plays a key role in the internet assets in this province, which includes overseeing the Alberta Supernet. While Minister Nate Blubish, the Minister of Service Alberta, was unable to join us due to other obligations, he did provide us with a video greeting and update of the work he and his office are doing on this very important file. And so we will throw it to uh, Minister Glubish to send his greetings. Hello, and thanks for inviting me to join you today. Uh, I'm Nate Glubish, Minister of Service Alberta. We all know how important connectivity is. Uh, I don't think that's really the question. I th and I, I certainly believe that, that the COVID-19 pandemic has really highlighted the importance of this need, uh, whether it's to ensure that all Albertans, including those in rural communities, can, uh, can access uh, remote education or remote health care or can, uh, can work from home remotely. Uh, all of these needs have been uh, amplified as a result of the pandemic, and this has just brought this issue to the forefront for so many Albertans. Um, and that's why the work that I've been doing as Minister of Service Alberta on developing a province-wide broadband strategy is so important. And I want to assure you that there is a ton of work going on behind the scenes as we continue to work on developing this strategic framework. Um, and I can't always say all of it publicly, but I want to bring a, a few items to your attention today to give you some confidence and assurance that this is a priority for me and it is a, an ex extremely important issue that we're working hard to tackle. Um, I think one of the important things to, to uh, highlight, first of all, is that I do not believe it makes sense to do a one-size-fits-all policy. Another way that I work hard to make sure that uh, we're not doing a one-size-fits-all uh, approach here is through extensive meetings with municipalities, with the federal government, with indigenous communities and Métis settlements, uh, as well as with the private sector, uh, you know, the telcos and, and internet service providers from the big ones all the way down to the, the, the smallest ones. Um, though, though that collaboration is so important because everyone involved in those conversations is trying to solve this problem and all of them have unique insights based on their geographic location, based on their technology uh, background, 
uh, based on their uh, business strategies. They all have unique uh, offerings to, to bring to the table as we seek to chart the best and most optimal path forward to improve rural connectivity. And so it's been my effort to work closely with all of them uh, and to have an open door and an and ongoing dialogue to ensure that we're all pulling in the same direction and that we are uh, tackling this problem in the, the most intelligent way possible. Um, one of the things that came out of those discussions that I learned that was really helpful for me is, is I learned that um, you know, there, there was, of course, the Federal Universal Broadband Fund, which had uh, $1.75 billion of funds to disperse across the country to solve or to, to assist in solving the rural connectivity challenges. Um, and certainly, Alberta deserves to have its fair share of, of that, those funds. And so as I was talking with the various um, uh, telcos and municipalities who were working towards uh, putting applications in for universal broadband funding, they shared with me that the, the, the February 15th deadline for, for getting those applications in this year was too short of a deadline and that many of them would not be able to get a comprehensive application in, in time. And this would be bad news for Alberta because it would mean that many projects that were in the works uh, might not succeed, might not proceed uh, either at all or at least in, in the upcoming year. And so uh, I heard loud and clear the importance of this problem and I got to work right away in advocating with my counterparts in Ottawa. Um, I wrote to Minister Monsef outlining these challenges um, and uh, advocated uh, and recommended that they should uh, extend that deadline. And I'm really great, grateful that they heard our request and, uh, and honored it and in fact moved that deadline back a month to March 15th. And as a result, we know that many many applications uh, were able to be made from Alberta for Alberta projects that otherwise would not have uh, gotten in, in time. Um, and, and some great news even just this week uh, of some projects approved by the UBF uh, for over, f over 40 uh, rural communities. Um, we know that there was also a few announcements back in December uh, out of their, their, the UBF's rapid response stream for the communities of Starland and Stetler counties. So th this is uh, you know, some positive momentum showing that uh, the collaboration between all levels of government and the private sector to solve this problem is, uh, is setting us off in the right direction and is going to really move the needle for, for thousands and thousands of Alberta households who currently today are underserved uh, and as a result of these investments and as a result of our advocacy are so much closer to getting access to reliable high-speed connectivity. But the work must continue. Um, you know, the, the UBF funding, even if Alberta got all of its fair share, would not be enough to close the gap and get every rural community the connectivity they need. And so that is why my work on the, the, the broadband strategy uh, continues, the, the consultation with all the telcos and, and all levels of government continues. And we're working to determine what is the best way to leverage all of the existing infrastructure in the ground, to leverage the best technologies that are best suited for the, the different geographic regions in the province, um, and to identify the best roles that, that I can play as a minister uh, and that the government of Alberta can play to maximize these investments uh, in delivering better connectivity all across the province. So um, I want to acknowledge the concerns and frustrations that uh, many of you might feel, but I want to assure you this is a priority for me, it's a priority for this government. We're working hard to close the gap. We've made some inroads here and some successes of, of um, uh, uh, improving the way in which the Universal Broadband Fund is, is managed and ensuring that Albertans, uh, Alberta projects are getting funding from this program. And that work will continue and I anticipate there will be many opportunities in the coming weeks and months for me to connect with, with you and the many municipalities that are working to solve this problem uh, and just want to encourage you that that dialogue will continue. Thank you, uh, Minister Glubish, for uh for your uh, remarks and, and an update on what the ministry is doing. Uh, we're now gonna begin our first presentation. So Don McLeod is the chief administrative officer for the town of Viking. Uh, prior to his arrival to Viking, 
Don spent 22 years working in civic administration in Saskatchewan, most recently in the town of Maple Creek. Viking has received a lot of uh, attention as of late, especially about two years ago, one and a half years ago, when they uh, adopted an interesting approach uh, to connect their town. So Don, welcome. Hi there, glad to be here. Excellent. So, so Don, I, I'll, I'll allow you to kind of carry it away and, and start from the beginning. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll do my best to try and keep people informed, a little bit entertained, but um, I do get carried away because I'm quite passionate about this subject. Um, basically, we were being serviced by a local provider, uh, and the service was not adequate for our needs uh, in, in our town with the download speed and the upload speed, which just didn't meet our capabilities, especially now with some of the files that we we have to um, utilize as part of our um, everyday working uh, with, you know, with our engineers and so on like that. It just makes a total difference in regards to the, what you can do and so on like that. So we, we, were, um, we were in the town of Viking, which is out about, uh, we, we are uh, we're at the town of Viking, which is just east of Edmonton on Highway 14, and uh, we have a we're in the heart of some very some of the finest green country in in the province, and PNH built the brand new inland terminal uh, just west of town here, and they were you know, they were trying to get uh, Telus to put in uh, um, fiber optics out to their out to their far out to their elevator, which of course they can do. And so they did. And then at the same time, I approached Telus to say, well, hey, can we get it to the town office? And to bring it four blocks from Main Street down to the town office was like $80,000. So like many small communities in the area here, we cannot afford that. Uh, that is just, that was out of our ballpark. So I got looking around and I'm not quite sure who said necessity is the mother of invention, but uh, I think I looked it up and I think Plato, Socrates, or Plato way back when had uh, mentioned that. So what we did is I got talking to our, our IT people who are uh, out of cameras and they're a company called Electrotel, New Tech Electrotel. And we were talking with them and I was approaching them about, well, what can we do? Is there anything that we can do regarding this? And they said to me, well, we, we provide internet to our subscribers. We have, an, uh, we have wireless internet that we beam out and we send it to our customers and they, you know, we sell them a service. So we, so I got thinking, well, where do we have, where do we have broadband? You know, where do we have fiber optics in, in town here other than TELUS? And we're fortunate enough to have our library in our town building. So of course they have SuperNet, which the government paid for, I don't know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, to put it into all the libraries uh, in the province. And I do believe like there's 432 of them that were uh, put in, but they're in our building. So we approached, um, we're, we're basically buying bandwidth from Axia Bell uh, and then reselling it on the, uh, reselling it. And what we did is we have it beamed over to a tower or to the Providence Grain Elevator, which is uh, the highest point in town, which is 96 feet above the rest of town. And we just put a dish on the building, dish over there, and we beam it. And basically, uh, we're getting, we're rating right that uh, 46 to 55 upload speed and or download speed. And upload speeds can be as high as 75. So huge files just disappear, just they're just gone. So the other thing was too, is that of course, now we use uh, SIP lines. Uh, so we, we are, um, so we're, we've also saved money in that regards that we, we were able to get rid of most of our TELUS lines that uh, saved us uh, almost uh, $1,200 a month. In, in different phone lines and so on, and all the services we had associated with TELUS. And the many thing, a lot of what people don't realize is on their TELUS bills is that they're still paying for um, 
uh, yellow page ads, which I don't know anybody that uses a yellow page or a phone book anymore, but <laughs> that's the way they did it. So right now, so what we did is we thought of this as how, how are we going to, what, what are we going to do with, uh, how are we going to make this work for the town? So we treat it as a utility that we, that we offer to, to town residents. And that's what we do is we offer it as part of the utility package and you sign up for it and it's a three-year term and our rates are very competitive. Uh, our, unlimited, our unlimited package uh, sells for $117, uh, $118 a month. Uh, we have various other packages where we have it in uh, from anywhere from 60 to $118 a month. Uh, we have, weather doesn't affect it, we're, we're doing well. And the other thing that is, is that we're offered it, we're able to offer it to a rural customers as well. As long as you're within the line of sight of the Providence Grain Elevator, you can get the wireless internet. And I know that uh, we've had great, uh, great success with bringing people on board with that. And the biggest, I guess the biggest challenge uh, starting the internet service in Viking uh, when I looked at it in 2019 was the fact that uh, the big telcos weren't interested. Uh, they were interested in the Highway 2 corridor. That, that's their main, as, as we know, that's where the main population of Alberta is in, is in the Highway 2 corridor. And there was just zero interest in, uh, there, I just don't understand why the, the, the you know, why they wouldn't come out here. Well, the, the answer is obvious. It's because of the fact that they, they won't make any money out here. It's just not the business model to suit themselves. And, you know, so we went ahead and anyways, we, we just, we went ahead and did it. Uh, and we've had lots of people, we've had a number of people sign up. Uh, we generate, right now we generate approximately a thousand dollars a month in revenue for our our uh, for our uh, for, for our um, you know the the pro people that are applying here. So we're we're doing well. The other thing is is that um, we had done you know we we need to like I say right now also we are also under increased pressure from the province and other people. Or other, you know, how do you increase revenue without raising taxes? So this is a service that we offer to to our our ratepayers as part of a, an overall package, and it just bills on your on your uh, water your bimonthly water bill. Uh, the other providers are still in town, and people are free to deal with them. They don't have the speeds that we have, uh, so I mean. You know that's that's up to them. They can choose or pick or choose or whatever. So it makes no difference to us. But what we're also doing is we're reaching out, and in our area, it was the uh, Viking gas field that put this town on the map, uh, along with the Sutter brothers, of course. But they have uh, there are towers, unused towers, uh, 90, uh, 100 foot, 150 foot towers, all over the place out in this area. So it's a simple matter of putting up the towers. Uh, you know, you know, leasing the towers from the from whoever owns them, and putting our our transmitters or radios on those, and that way we're able to reach out to farmers uh, in the area without a whole lot of trouble. And we're we're currently in the process of uh, upgrading that service. And so, anyways, what we're doing is we're upgrading that service and we're putting in these uh, different uh, towers and people are starting to come online with that as well. So my goal was to get 100 people or you know, 100 people signed up uh, to get that done. And we were on our way to doing that. Unfortunately, when COVID hit, then it's a, it's a big thing. And so what we're doing is we're, we're, we're working on that. And so the, the cost, there is no cost to the town. There is no cost to the town other than that the uh, it's it, they, there's just no cost actually to the town for providing this service. They, we we everything runs through our our provider, 
or new tech and everything runs through them and they do all the service work, they do all the maintenance work and we have a revenue sharing agreement with them and we bill, bill uh, they send us the, we bill out the internet, they send us the usage and if there's any overages or so on, we'll either you know adjust the packages of people, we contact them and adjust the packages. So actually we're doing, we're doing quite well uh, in that regard. And like I say, it's a, it's a thing where we need as a small community uh, that's out in the middle of nowhere that we need to provide uh, services to our ratepayers. The people here are very happy to have it, especially the uh, people who are schooling from home right now uh, that this is available to them because their kids have no problem. Uh, I'll just relate a, an incident is that uh, when our uh, when we first put it in, uh, the local newspaper was hesitant because they were using one of the big, they were using a, a big Tesco. And what they did is uh, our, our, new, our IT guy just happened to be here and we had an electrical storm and their router got fried. So he went over there and he got them all set up again and got them going. And then, you know, they were quite impressed with that. So they tried us. And they they download they download for they download from there, and then uh, download from Viking to a, another town, and it was taking anywhere up to twenty minutes to send their package of, of data to their printers at this other shop. Well, they hooked up to us, and their package went in less than a minute. The 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 package went in less than a minute. Well, he was quite impressed and. He can't say enough good things about it. Um, you know, we we just we waited around. We waited for the government. You know, rural Alberta has been, or and rural Saskatchewan, rural anywhere in Canada, has been waiting for, you know, the federal government and the provincial governments to make this happen for so many years. So it it's just it never happened. So at the end of the day, you have to do it yourself. And that's what we did in Viking. We saw a niche that we could fit into. And after talking with uh, Holly uh, Salou at the uh, Alberta, with the Alberta government, um, we've been able to do that. We're, we're licensed CRTC. Uh, we're, we resell the internet. And slowly, we're, as people's contracts are, are coming due, they're coming over, they're coming to us, and we're adding more and more people all the time. You know, that's the other thing, like we don't have the money to be able to buy out contracts to make our business model grow. But initially, the initial cost of the whole system uh, was somewhere between six and nine thousand dollars. That's all it cost us. So, you know, I, I know other other towns have different models and it's working well for them. That's fantastic. I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to dissuade anybody from what doing what they're doing or whatever, but in a small community like ours, who doesn't have a lot of money, yet we still need high-speed internet, this is an option that's available. And that's the way, um, you know, I look at it. Uh, I've, uh, I'm just going through some of my notes here. Um, it has been a, a very positive aspect for the community. I know that uh, when you're when you're trying to attract uh, businesses to communities, this is one of the most important things they look at now: is do you have high speed internet available to you? And for us, the answer can, is now yes. Whereas previously it wasn't. So you know, I'm not like I say. I'm, I'm just trying to provide a, a, an overview of how we did it. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's about the long and the short of it. It took about four months to get it done or less, and away we went. And we're starting to add, I think we're up to about four, about 50 people subscribers now. We started out with 25, and now we're just about up to 50. So that's about it on, for my part. Well, that's uh, that's a, quite a remarkable story to to kind of see how you brought that ingenuity into it. Um, so uh, earlier we we chatted on the phone, and 
And the thing that blew me away was how low the cost was associated to this. Like you really paid about $6,000 to implement this? Not, not much more than that. Nope. Yeah. So, um, and obviously a replacement router when it, whenever, when you had that one with the lightning storm fried, yeah. but, um, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's, we, we, you know, we signed a contract with them and they're, you know, there's the, the company new tech is a, is responsible for replacing and maintaining all that equipment. And then we also have, you know, like there, uh, like some people, they've got extremely large houses and, you know, they're on three separate levels. And so they need a little more equipment in their house, but that's all when they, when they come out to do the initial site evaluation, uh, then they, they go in there and they see what the people need and then they make the recommendations and then they purchase what they need and they buy that directly from new tech. Oh, that's, that's excellent. So you kind of have a pretty good partnership with, with new tech when you're, when you're working with this kind of like a collaboration model, if you will. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, yes. And I see there's a question about our costs from, from, uh, from, uh, uh, Axia Bell, and our, our costs are approximately uh, uh, eight hundred thousand dollars a month in total to to them. And uh, I know that Holly and I are are going to be meeting with uh, with that uh, with um, with them to uh, see if we can get that reduced. Uh, my point on that is that this they bought the system. And they haven't, you know, they paid for the system, but the government paid for the system in the first place. And now they're, they're making money. And, for, you know, there's, you know, there, I know there's upkeep and so on like that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, to me, you know, they, they really have to do nothing. If they put up 432 of these at $1,000 a month, uh, hey, that's pretty simple. That's pretty nice money. I mean, I can do a quick calculation here and tell you what it is, but I'm sure there's smarter people than me can do that in their head. So, but I mean, that's, it's, 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 to me, it was very simple. Uh, maybe that's the Saskatchewan way of doing stuff. I don't know. Fair enough. You, well, you tied into like the, the Sutter brothers and, and kind of that, that uh, the, the no uh, no thrill sort of mentality of it, you know, I'm, I'm expecting yep. a big backhoe to come in when you're bringing in a major infrastructure project, but yep. um, but here you are putting it in a tower you probably wouldn't have noticed except if you turned your phone on and saw the the Wi-Fi speed. Yeah, well, the, the, that's that's exactly right. Like it's not broadband. Now it's not broadband. Mm -hmm. Now don't it's not not like what Vermilion has and other places have. It's just point to point, and you have to have the dish hooked up. So it's not available, you know, outside your house type of thing. But I, I know I did, a, I did a test at my house the other night and I had upload speed or download speed of uh, 55 and upload speed of 80. Wow. Yeah, that's comparing what I have in the city here. Like, and I have a copper network going into my old sort of 50s neighborhood. That's, uh, that's what I get with copper, right? So... <laughs> Um, you spoke about the CRTC and, uh, yes. and being licensed there. Did you find it difficult to do uh, the licensing or, or was it pretty straightforward? The, the, the uh, Holly, she walked me through it. Just uh, that took probably about three days to a week to get it done. Fill out the paperwork, send it in, answer their questions. I mean, it was it was very straightforward. Uh, so, and then every year we file our return to them, and our license stays stays good. Looking at the administrative side of things, did you have to hire a lot more people to help facilitate this uh, this program? We didn't hire a soul. Nobody, because we we don't look after the the infrastructure. We we. Part of the bill, part of the $120 that we, that or $118 that I pay every month, part of that comes to the town, and then that covers our costs. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, it's part of our administration. It's part of our administration when we, when we uh, do our water bills. You have your 
like in you know lots of the you know anybody that's a that's a town or CAO or a town person, you know you've got your your water bill, you got on your water bill, your sewer, your garbage, and now we have internet, and it just you you pay it every you pay you pay it every two months, and that's it. And if there's any any problems with it, uh, we send a service request uh, to New Tech, and they look after it. Uh, when you're dealing with the service request, how quick is the turnaround for that? Uh, it's very good. Uh, in, a, in a lot of cases, it's, it's quite excellent. Uh, I know that they are, um, we have some, there are some limited issuing or issues sometimes with getting out to service somebody that's outside the, the immediate area here. Uh, if they need a, a part or something like that, they usually have them in stock. But there again, it's a, it's a matter of uh, lining up the time to come out and do it. But the, they, they do the best. They, they, uh, New Tech contacts the, the, the owner that's, or the participant that's having problems, tries to walk them through how to, how to fix it. And if that doesn't work, they schedule an appointment and usually they're out there in one to two days to, to get it fixed. And a lot of times it's just they can walk them through it and uh, they can resolve the problem. And the next time they're out, they go and replace the faulty part. Excellent. Uh, um, once, 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 so just sorry about that. Oh, once, you pay, once you pay for it, like once you buy the equipment or pay for that, whatever you have, if it is faulty, New Tech replaces it at no cost. Oh, excellent. So it's... Uh... It's pretty, uh, pretty streamlined there for, your, for the uh, consumer. Uh, for those who are just joining us, I know some people have jumped on a little bit late. late. We have um, Don McLeod from the town of Viking who's discussing their, their project that they have here. Um, now, in relation to this, if any people have some questions, feel free to throw them in the chat below. Um, I know that I, I will, there's some- I will, try, I will try to answer them, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm no tech guy. I'm, I'm the guy that says, well, make it work for me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's sort of that uh, the the thing that the prairies were built on. Just make it happen, and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. Um, do you, do you have any idea about any challenges you might face with Spectrum? Has Spectrum ever come up when you were uh, when you were working with the CRTC or looking to roll this out? No, nothing nothing like that was ever brought forward. Uh, they, uh, I talked. In fact, I did talk to a lady. Uh, with the CRTC, a board commissioner with the CRTC, and she thought it was very innovative that we had done this. Could, uh, could the board commissioner think of any, uh, any examples of this happening before? Is this kind of one of its, one of its first? With, with the exception, I know there's a few mesh networks that have been set up in, in areas like Muscochese and here in Alberta, too. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you ultimately set this up on on your grain elevator there and, and you're looking kind of as you go forward to, to put it on some of the the old oil towers yep. um, are those conversations progressing are you having uh, uh, easy time getting the leases for those or? well the, the 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 initial one had no problem the the biggest problem we're having of course is a lot of these a lot of these towers are owned by companies that are bankrupt mm. and or you can't find who to talk to so that, that is progressing more slowly, but we're starting to utilize, uh, uh, for example, we have a, uh, south of town, we have a large, large hog operation run by the, one of the local Hutterite colonies. Well, they have a big leg where they mix all their feed and everything. Mm -hmm. we, could put the, we could put one on that big leg and that would allow us to reach out uh, basically 16 kilometers south of town from the elevator out to that area and then we could beam from there back to their home colony which is about eight kilometers away eight to nine kilometers away so you know and then you know it carries on that way right so it's it's uh so far we haven't run into any issues with that it's just a matter of trying to you know pin these guys down so that we can get uh, have face-to-face -face meetings with them and uh, get them showing how it works and how it'll benefit their communities 
And right now, farmers are one of the biggest users of internet because they buy and sell their, all their grain and they book all their stuff online. Uh, it's huge. I mean, farming is big business, as, as you know. So, you know, we have been reaching out and uh, like I say, COVID last year really did a number on everybody. And I mean, uh, so we're trying to recover from that and we're going to try and hit it hard this, this spring and summer and see if we can get our numbers up. Oh, excellent. Uh, um, how far can the connectivity towers reach? Um, like if you, if you were to find one of those oil towers and, and send the signal from yeah. the grain elevator to that we're, tower. We're, yeah. we're, con we're comfortable sending it 15 kilometers. Okay, so like there's a dot and then 50 kilometers any direction. Yeah, 15, yeah, 15 kilometers uh out to that and then you add then of course then you have then you can extend your range to the north or you know everywhere else eh? and mm -hmm. yes it does depend on the terrain and that's why we're looking for these towers is so that we can we can do that and uh google earth is a wonderful uh tool because you can uh uh How many gigabytes of internet transmit do you get for uh, seven terabytes, I believe, is the answer to that one, or more, or 32 terabytes, I think. I'm not quite sure. There again, that's a new tech question. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, we, we uh, you, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, the, the uh, yeah, so we send it out to these towers, and then we can just keep leapfrogging from there to the next one. And then once it reaches the, once, like we're out at a tower that's about 15 kilometers northwest of town. And at the tower, the download speed is 76. Oh, wow. Yep. So, um, so how many people ultimately do you think you'd be able to cover? Like this would be potential people who could connect, not like actual subscribers. Well, I mean, if you connected to the, like, if you connected to the Hutterite colony, I mean, I, you know, they, they vary in size up to two, 300 people. Now, I don't know how many people would have access to it, but I do know that um, we have, you know, a lot of families who are interested that are, like I say, they've got, you know, two, three kids. And if we could get like a hundred families out in the rural, that would be four or 500 people that we would be able to connect to the to the internet to the high speed internet now i know that sometimes uh, you may not be privy to these conversations but have you seen any businesses that have been considering biking um, to open up shop now obviously covid has has me thrown a wrench in any of those conversations but uh, does this kind of put your city into a, or your town into an area where they might be able to attract further business well we're we're working on that of course the same as every other small town trying to attract some sort of industry or business to come to town and you know like the, the whole point is is that it's one more thing that you can offer that somebody else might not have offered mm -hmm. and, and then that's the case and then the other case that we're looking at of course is that the cost of living in in a smaller town is extraordinarily cheap compared to you know the cities and there's the safety and all that as well. I mean, the town of Viking has much to offer and I won't go into that. You can check our webpage out. But the thing is, is that if you're looking for an increase in the quality of life at a reduced cost, most, a lot of people work from home. A lot of people run online businesses. You don't have to be in the city to do that. You know, you're running out of your home. And, you know, if you can move out here, sell your house in Edmonton or, Red Deer or Calgary for, you know, six, seven hundred thousand dollars buy a really nice three bedroom house out here for, uh, so, you know, it's, uh, uh, so you, you come out here and you can buy a nice house for less than three hundred thousand dollars. Plus your kids can walk, and your kids can walk to school. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair prospect. I, I can, I can, I can feel the appeal of that, uh, that myself, you know, obviously, as you've alluded to, COVID has been a kind of a challenge for um, 
for expanding the the business, if you will, or or the prospecting clientele. But you know, in the next five to ten years, how do you see this uh, evolving over that time? Well, it, it's hard to say. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I I really don't know what the future holds. I mean, if I knew that, I'd be retired a long time ago. But uh, we're just going to keep plugging along with what we got. And as, as equipment advances, we will be implementing those changes. And I know it changes constantly. Uh, so I'm just trying to, like I say, I'm just trying to make sure that we keep up and we keep our present cu customers happy and keep the, you know, keep people joining in. Do you think this will always be something that's kind of ran by city administration or, or through the water utility, or would it be something that you'd be open to, to outsourcing? Do you know in, in the future what that might be? Well, I for? mean, there's, like I, like I say, there's very little, you know, there's very little work involved with the, with the, with our, on our end of it, right? We, we, we bill it out and basically that's what we do. And, uh, you know, people come in and pay their water bills and they just, if they have internet, they know it's going to be, you know, you know, on a, on a, on a two months, it's going to be $120 more than what their neighbor's water bill is going to be because they don't have internet service. So, you know, and, and, the other, and the other thing that people are really starting to notice now is that of course, now uh, some of the, some of the uh, people are getting uh, smart TVs. And of course you can have all these streaming services on there. And all of a sudden they're saying, well, wait a second, how come I got such a high internet bill? Well, that's because you're streaming all the time. It's, you leave it stream like you used to watch, you know, cable news type of thing, right? Or your satellite, right? And I said, you can't do that. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I guess I shouldn't do that, should I? So it's kind of funny in that respect. But at the end of the day, we have, you know, the, the, the accolades far away the, the complaints. Excellent. So do you see, tying into that, do you see any latency or slowdown whenever you're, uh, whenever, like, let's say it's 7 p.m. And, and the hockey game's on and some people are using it to stream it uh, online. Um, do you ever find that it slows down in some of the network or? Yes, it does. I mean, there's no question about it, especially with homeschooling. Uh, and, and of course, the same thing with, you know, with uh, the after school internet. Uh, and, you know, the biggest time we noticed a lot of the change was when uh, Disney Plus came on. And, I mean, that was huge. I mean, that just, wow. You know, uh, so we're, we were just, uh, un it blew us away how much that took at that time. Fair but, enough. So if, if you could give any advice to to a small town that's looking to explore this, they might have a, a little bit of budgetary constraints and, um, and they might not necessarily know how to bridge the digital divide and, and, but do want to connect their, their town or community. Um, what advice would you give to them? Don't give up. Talk to your local IT people if you have them in the area. area see if they can see what they can do for you. Um, you know, like I say, we're fortunate because in our Viking Karina complex, we have the library in here. So it's basically upstairs from us. And it comes in here and then it away it goes. And so I mean, there's always solutions to problems. You just got to look for them. I guess that's the that's the 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 biggest thing that I can offer to to the people is, you know. Don't don't let somebody say you can't do it. Excellent. That's that's good advice to go by. And then just a final question. When you look back at kind of when you entered uh, and you moved to Viking to take on the role that you're in, and uh, you've you've how would you say that that things have evolved following this initiative? And, and how can you say that your your community is has been impacted because of these directions? I, I really, you know, I don't know how to really answer that one. You know, I, I, I guess, I mean, I did reach out to our local provider who we were using about our slow speeds and poor service that we were getting. And I, I just couldn't, 
convince them to spend the money or whatever they needed to do to upgrade as they told me, well, we just upgraded the system to the current speeds and there is no plans in the present time to do any more. Well, I just said to, I, 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 you know, well, that's not acceptable. And so therefore, you know, then that's when I really started digging in. And then of course, the next thing happened of, with the TELUS coming in and putting in the fiber optics out to P and H and so on. And then that just started the whole ball rolling. So things just kind of fell into place after that and uh, away we went. Now, again, I'll stress this isn't for everybody. And, you know, it won't work in every situation. Uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is so good. You know, this is what happens is that, you know, we just, you know, we try our best to work with the local providers and, they, and, then, and then something happens. But we just make the, we made the decision that we were going to go this way, made the package, put it together, presented it to the council, and council decided to go for it. Excellent. And I think, uh, and I think you, you've, you've pinned it on the, or hit the nail on the head with that one, which is, and I think it's going to be an ongoing theme, which is uh, one size doesn't fit all when it, when it comes to these implementations and that it, it may take a lot of different solutions. It, it certainly does. And I'm not going to, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to stand here in my soapbox and preach that everybody should do this because it doesn't work for everybody. And I'm not doing that. That's not what I'm, what I'm doing it. And I'm not, and I'm not, uh, I see uh, a, a notice there from, from one person that, you know, I'm not painting all small providers with the same picture. I'm only painting, I'm only saying what happened to us. That's all I'm saying. I'm not painting all the small providers. I'm sure there's a lot of excellent small providers out there and they're working hard to improve their services. But at the time when we started this, that we just, we couldn't come to a satisfactory agreement. Now, you know, I'm not, like I say, I'm not trying to pick fights with anybody or anything like that. I'm just saying it'll work for us. Yeah, well, and, and that's what we're here today today to is, is talk about solutions and, and what's worked for, for specific communities. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm in my suburb in, in Calgary right now and, and I, internet's like a light switch for me. Um, right. and, and that's not necessarily the case for everyone. And, and so right. we'll always have that that fair conversation about about what it's like in in northern southern and and east to west here don thank you uh thank you so much for for reaching out to us and uh thank you for inviting me i i, I appreciate that and i'm sorry if i couldn't answer all of the questions that uh, everybody had on there uh trying to talk and read at the same time well uh, i'm old and i'm getting uh <laughs> i'm getting i'm getting old for that and uh <laughs> you know uh, fair enough yeah. Well, the last thing, the last thing I have to say is go riders. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I, I, I won't, I won't start that war. There's a lot of CFL fans from different teams here. Okay. Excellent. All right. uh, Don, Don, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. We're now going to move a hundred kilometers uh, northeast to Vermilion. Uh, Carolyn McCauley has spent 30 years in Vermilion. She was first elected uh, town council in 2009 and then became the mayor in 2017. Uh, we're excited to have uh, Mayor McCauley here to uh, discuss the broadband initiatives that Vermilion has, uh, has taken on. Your Honor, thank you for, for joining us here today. Oh, well, thank you for having us. And I just wanted to say thank you to Don for sharing his story, because I, I think in all of it, in our story too, it's really about uh, what can you do and believing you actually can do something. So don't be deterred by what you think you can't do. So um, I do have a little bit of a PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm going to see if I can share my screen. And if that doesn't work, if all that fails, I do know I've given it to you. So I'm just not finding my PowerPoint here. Do you have it um, easy to go? Oh, maybe, nope, I don't there. I stand by if we, if I have to pull it up, I, I can easily pull it up for- If you wanna pull it up, that'd be great. That'll just, All right. honestly, I'm just not seeing it on my desktop. It is there, but. All 
All right, bear with me for 30 seconds as I, as I get it loaded up here for you. Yeah, I'm glad it's your 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> So I can just give a little bit of history while you're finding it about Vermilion. Um, we are situated on Highway 16, um, the Yellowhead Highway and on uh, Highway 41 um, going north. And so actually Highway 41 goes all the way eventually to Fort McMurray. So we're on a major crossroad. Our community is a mix of college. Um, so we have Lakeland College, main campus, agriculture and oil. Um, our Lakeland College actually has a fully operational robotic barn, so they use um, uh, technology to do that. And then ironically, they have no internet or very limited internet to their residences, so it's really challenging for their, for their students. Um, and uh, this was sort of a brief discussion, you know, brainstorming at Council in 2014. And at that time, it was kind of like, oh, I don't know if we can actually go in here. So we didn't. Um, but then we moved on um, in 2017. So next slide. And so a little bit about our journey. Um, like I said, we had initial conversations in 2013. And then in 2017, our RITA, our R uh, Regional Economic Development Association, um, called HUB, um, commissioned Craig Dobson to do a Northern Alberta broadband preparedness study. So they really identified uh, broadband as a potential um, opportunity around economic development in our region and wanted to understand how prepared were our municipalities in our, in our area. And really looking at um, did we meet CRTC minimum guidelines? And um, if we did, where were they at? And where were the opportunities and challenges? So it really kind of made us look at it. Is, is community broadband a municipal responsibility? And this is when you think about when this timing was. This was still really at a time when um, municipalities are very much looking at roads and uh, infrastructure from the perspective of water service a garbage collection, parks, recreation. This was not on the radar of, of municipalities at all. It was really seen as um, outside, similar to electricity and um, telephone service. So it was seen by a, as a telecom provider. Um, so our RITA really looked at partnering with this high level report um, to just re and really it highlighted how far behind our region in northern Alberta was with respect to connectivity. You heard Don talk a little bit about how the telecoms have really focused on that Highway 2 corridor, and this was very much evident in this report. Next slide. So why is broadband important? And you guys in this conference have been certainly talking about it, but it is something that it impacts everything we do in a municipality. So um, we have actually a regional center, for example, where we host conferences. It's starting to become important that conferences could actually zoom people in, could uh, have um, you know PowerPoints or uh, live streaming happening. We were challenged even to move our conference center into the 21st century and allow internet to expand the offerings that we would have for conferences. It's about uh, our businesses. So we certainly heard from our business sector um, that this was key just all the way from uh, on the spot, um, you know, payment uh, opportunities all the way to um, you know, training staff, um, zooming in opportunities, uh, live streaming conversations from uh, far away communities, all those kinds of things that make um, business successful. Our residents certainly, and they were, they're fairly comfortable for the most part. They, they do complain about Netflix and things. And now that kids are home, they certainly are complaining a whole lot more around their broadband a bandwidth, but um, it was certainly residents was one of our perspective, but then really looking at that business expansion. So we're on a, in a situation where we have opportunity for site selectors to consider our community. We have some res, uh, industrial property that's available for sale. And we were starting to struggle because site selectors are asking you how much broadband width do you have? 
uh, healthcare in terms of attracting physicians, having uh, telehealth opportunities was becoming a challenge. Emergency services, 911 calls when you're in the middle of somewhere and you don't have good connectivity. And then I spoke a little bit about our, about our education sector and the challenges that they were having. So in order to compete in today's world, a rural municipality needs to consider uh, their broadband connectivity as part of their economic development strategy. So the next slide. In early 2018, um, we actually put it on as the, one of the number one items on our broad on our strategic plan as a municipality. So that was already a huge shift. You can see that the conversation was starting to happen in 2013, percolating, getting uh, councillors comfortable. We had uh, the majority of our councillors uh, got re-elected. We had two new individuals. They were younger. They also saw the uh, need for broadband. And so this became an easier conversation um, the second time around. And, and really the conversation was, can we do this? And if not us, then who? And so it really became uh, exploring uh, what are the telecoms out there? Are they prepared to come to Vermilion? Will they service us? So we certainly did have conversations with the CEO, Brian Bettis of TELUS, talking about, you know, could Vermilion be on your list? And, um, and certainly didn't get very far with that other than having the opportunity to provide TELUS with a lot of money to put it in, which we felt um, we couldn't do at the time. So over the last three years, the town of Vermilion has continued on a journey. And I'm going to say it's for us, it's been a journey. I was so happy to hear with Dawn that it was like, gosh, we got a solution. We're just going to do this and we're going to make it work. And for us, it's been more of a journey. And really looking at, um, is this going to be utility or not? Uh, do we uh, partner with somebody and we, we share it? Do we take it on slowly? Um, how do we get uh, our council totally on board? How do we get then administration getting that level of comfort and then moving out further to business and residents? So it's really about how you, uh, you know, expand that conversation outside and really looking at who are the current players in the system? Is there opportunity to partner with them or not? What funding opportunities are there available? So lots of questions and lots of work that administration um, has had to do. Um, we certainly have had challenges. Our, our community is currently serviced with a combination of Shaw and TELUS. Some places exclusively served by those two um, telecoms. Some of them have some overlap. So where I live, for example, I have a choice, but TELUS is still based on the old, um, uh, you know, copper wire. And then uh, Shaw is more of the uh, cable um, connection. So uh, some of the challenges certainly were, uh, you know, really convincing people too that this goes beyond Netflix. This is really about economic development in our community. And so one of the things to consider is how do you how do you make culture shift or culture change as you um, as you start considering this as a council or as a municipality? And it's first, first of all really creating that awareness that there is a gap then how do I make that desire known that, okay, maybe, maybe we're gonna do something about it. So now I need a whole bunch of knowledge. So I gotta understand what the situation is and how to work out there. Um, then you can move to action. And then how do you reinforce that down the road? So it's really that moving through those stages of change. So here's where the change began. Next slide. Kind of started with the Digital Futures Conference. We went to the one in Pincher Creek in 2017, and then we hosted one in 2018. And this gave us an opportunity actually to start engaging our business sector. And we actually had um, some Vermilion businesses present and we asked them, tell us the challenges you have as a business provider. And then they spoke about point of sale, um, transactions. Uh, this one business we had spoke about security systems. He said, I got four security cameras and on a good day, half of them are working. And so just the challenges even around transmitting information from his shop, he has a, a storefront about a block and a half away, that communication even alone was very difficult. So 
Um, there was also the challenge of uh, previous councils not really fully understanding the critical importance of high speed. And I kind of spoke to that, that kind of getting that, that culture shift and that understanding and then moving that to the new council. And then really identifying this, that this was of, of high economic importance. This was not just about convenience so that my Netflix would work better. Or I'd be able to stream things from home. This was really driving it to that economic development to say, if we really want to be uh, a, a, a community that's standing out there, what, what am I selling that makes me competitive above other communities? So certainly I'm the most north uh, east um, rail line from east to west. I'm the most northern rail line. So I have that going through my community. I have um, a highway access on a major crossroad, but we really lacked uh, broadband connectivity, which is really becoming critical importance. All right, next slide. I hope I'm not going too fast. Um, so then in uh, November, um, so we have a loosely uh, connected group called the Vermilion River Regional Alliance. And it's consisting of uh, the county of Vermilion River with all the municipalities located within it, as well as Lakeland College and the village of Manville, which occurs, they're about 20 kilometers from the town of Vermilion, but they um, are in the next county, but we often include them because we're part of their trading trading area. So we took the report from Hub and we went a little bit deeper and we said, um, so what's the business case? So if we really wanted to, to go into this area, does it make financial sense? Is this actually something that we could make work and really um, consider, because if I'm going to spend uh, taxpayers dollars or have that support, I really need to have a strong business case. So we hired Craig Dobson to do this report. And we got a CARES grant. So this was a, a matching CARES grant that we used this to get this uh, information. And several meetings and months later, we eventually had a business case and a business plan um, for these municipalities. So now what? We've got, uh, we know what the problem is, <laughs> but what's the solution, right? So really looking at how do we move on to the next step? And there was a lot of fear of the unknown still at this point. Do we still go there? Gosh, this business case, we're going to need so much money. How are we going to get there? And um, we discovered from Vermilion's perspective that we just really needed a more in-depth study to kind of look at more of the particulars around um, how what the infrastructure could potentially look like. So if we wanted to go to fiber, um, which is truly um, the best form of of broadband service that we know of right now, um, how, how do we move to that next level? So the next slide. So in 2018-19, um, we received a second matching CARES grant and uh, we hired uh, Taylor Warwick again to develop that infrastructure plan. At this point, um, we started to lose a few of the partners in this group. Our villages were still very much interested. They uh, recognize that without this opportunity that our viability becomes um, smaller and smaller and so they really wanted to stay in this group. Um, the city of Lloydminster had signed an NDA um, with a uh, telecom and so at this point um, and so they had some changes as uh, challenges as well because they're half Saskatchewan half Alberta and so we couldn't use CARES grant to explore this Saskatchewan side so it started to become uh, somewhat more challenging to get that information and once they signed an NDA with the telecom we knew that they would probably get the service that they needed so um, they opted out and as well as the county um, had, had also was considering the, the massive cost of it and were quite concerned as to what this might look like. So it kind of boiled down then to a, a smaller group. All right, the next slide. Uh, so then uh, Vermilion really said, okay, you know what, enough studying, let's move on and actually look at, um, um, you know, where we're, where we're going to go from this. And so we decided we would start out with a pilot project, um, recognizing that any learnings that we would have, we would share with the villages around us. And possibly if we could 
um, network out to them so that they would have some options to get broadband uh, connectivity to the villages. So we agreed to be, I guess I want to say the test guinea pig and stand out there first and, and do it. Um, so we initially contemplated running the test with our retail businesses because they were the ones from point of sale perspective who had initially uh, identified the issue. But after having that um, digital futures conference, we started to talk to more of our, our larger business sector, the ag sector that I spoke of and some of our oil service sector. And they really said, oh my goodness, we are struggling. Even the veterinary clinic, surprisingly, the vet clinic said, by the time I have all my computers going, all my point of sales going, uh, my conversations, I'm, I'm really struggling with good broadband service. When they reached out to the telecoms, they were looking at anywhere between 20 and $30,000 just to dig a line to them across a road um, and then still not be guaranteed uh, great service because it would be either... Uh, connected by cable or connected to, to copper. So they would not be getting uh, full, ser full service. We had some sectors in our area who were getting almost no service at all. And that was our new industrial park. So we thought we'd run a test. And we thought we would pilot on our industrial sector since those are major employers in our community. And we just felt the risk of losing them was too great. We had one employer, for example, who had already moved in our community from the county because his broadband service in the county was even worse there than it was in our municipality. So he had moved to our municipality. He has uh, businesses across Alberta, across BC, across Saskatchewan, and we didn't want to risk him moving his head office, which is in Vermilion, to one of those other locations. So we needed to find a, a funding source. Um, and so that was... You can see we, we pretty much <laughs> went to everywhere we could, um, trying to find out where we, we could find some funding to help us move forward. Um, we, in most of our community, we meet the CRTC minimum, which is uh, 5010. And, uh, and we have patches of our community that doesn't meet it, but we couldn't get enough of a I want to say a volume in order to qualify or have enough value in getting the UBF fund. So that became a get that off the list. Then we looked at some of these other things. We applied as a smart city. Um, we uh, we uh, been speaking repeatedly with Service Alberta, with the ministry. We've uh, talked to Monseth um, and just couldn't seem to get anywhere. Um, so um, one of the challenges I'm going to say is if you're going down this road and you do uh, want to look at the UBF, um, one of the challenges we had is that our Vermilion was kind of painted as having really good service. And, um, and <laughs> when we actually explored it, the service was being provided by a smaller internet provider who actually doesn't provide that service um, at all really within our community or very minimally. And so it was interesting. It wasn't TELUS or Shaw that was identified. It was another small service provider. So even the reports that the federal government is using to identify where they can put a service and where the get biggest gaps in need are, I think it's really worth it for you to look at that um, report and to say, is this truly reflective of what our service delivery is? Because we found that there was errors in that report and getting that report changed is really difficult. All right, so next slide, we move on to the VNet project. So this was, um, we, we had to consider, do we have fiber to the premise or do we look at Wi-Fi? Do we look at a hybrid model? Um, are we doing retail versus wholesale? Um, so we, we struggled with that too, because initially we wanted our wholesale model. We wanted to get the service to the community and then allow the free market to choose who, who did you want. And so if a telecom wanted to come in, at least we would have the fiber portal into the community for, uh, access to all providers and then be able to go from there. Um, that was a dream. <laughs> and in the end, we wound up having to be our own ISP. So kind of, again, I think one of the lessons we had to learn is we had, we had to be flexible on the fly with this. We, we were meeting as a committee um, with administration and then making decisions and, uh, and moving forward. 
So VNet was really born out of a passion to create a connected community in Vermilion where businesses and residents could have access to technology services and experiences that you would find normally in the larger city. And it's very funny as we write that note to know that right now Toronto is looking at bringing in its own fiber network and moving away from the telecoms because the barrier of cost to the resident is so high. So I think it's very interesting. Sometimes we may look at those larger cities and think, oh, they got it so easy because telecoms just come in, but there's always, uh, the grass always seems greener on the other side. So we said, let's test it. So the next slide, we brought it to our ag fair. So obviously not this last year because there was no agriculture fair. It was the year before. The ag fair for us is a huge, homecoming huge event. So my population of Vermilion is uh, 4150. And in those three days, um, we will have over 20,000 people go through the gates of our fairgrounds, never mind uh, um, residents who don't attend and people who don't attend. So uh, we thought, let's test it out and see if, um, if a, a partnership with one of the uh, telecoms, having them bring the um, broadband to the community, we would tap into um, their one gig service. And, uh, and then we would allow it for free in our municipality, in our fairgrounds and test it. What happens when 20,000 people in three days want all access? And because one of the things we found is that even uh, cell phone service during those three days at the fairgrounds is horrific. Everyone's trying to find their kids, trying to find their friends, um, uh, you know, people asking for things back and forth, a point of sale for our vendors. So this was a great time to really test the system. And we used a combination of uh, hooking into the, to the fiber network, and then we um, had it broadcasted out. Um, we wanted to make sure that it was uh, scalable. So that's what we were really looking at testing here, that if we brought in a system, could it handle expansion? Um, and so that's what, this, that, that's what this test really was for three days. We learned a lot. We learned a lot. We learned that uh, the backhaul provider doesn't always necessarily deliver the speeds that we wanted. Matter of fact, they we paid for one gig. Yeah, that's not what we received at all. And so, um, so very challenging. Um, and, but it, it was a good a good learning for us that again, even with that, when you think you're getting what you think you should be getting you're not always getting what you should be getting or what you're paying for. So it was really uh, a really good test for us, but it allowed us to test the system that we were using and um, which was very good. So next slide. And I'm hoping, gosh, I didn't think I'd be able to fill three quarters of an hour, but I know my, my colleagues were not, were trusting that I'd be able to. <laughs> Hopefully I won't run over. Anyways, um, so again, we focused on the corporate community um, we wanted to an efficient system that was an alternative. The goal really of the pilot was to provide performance measures to us to understand. We wanted to understand uptake too, like if we wanted to do this in the future, what could be the uptake? Partnering with our Ag Society, um, they were super excited. We were at that time, we were the first um, agricultural fair in the province that actually provided free Wi Fi. So it was kind of a kudos to them, it was a great partnership. And, um, and then really looking at speeds and customer service to uh, support our business owners. So it was great. We toured our business uh, through as well, our business prospective business um, partners through this as well. So they could get an understanding of what the equipment looked like and the requirements and those things. So the next slide. Uh, so, what have been some of our challenges? Oh my goodness. Uh, certainly, I think the lack of awareness as to the strength of high-speed broadband in rural Alberta and really um, just the need of it. And I think, I mean, I mean, COVID has certainly put that over the top for all of us. You know, remember this was pre-COVID days. We were just trying to say to people, this is more than Netflix. And I think people now realize it's that. A, a real lack of knowledge as to how to assist rural municipalities. So we, as you can hear from this journey, like we are 
we are finding this all out on our own. It's like one step. Okay, that's not in the right direction. Maybe we'll take two steps in this direction. I want to be super grateful to uh, the team, the admin team that we have, our economic development officer and our admin team. I have a super passionate um, counselor on who has honestly taken this on as a champion and really worked hard. We had some great support from our, our contractor, Craig and things. So really helping us navigate because there's no map, there's no plan. <laughs> and as you go to the next one, there's still no provincial strategy. So I remember the 2018 uh, Digital Futures Conference talking to um, the ADM at the time or the DM, I think he is, and saying, you know, and he's like, you're going too fast, you're going too fast. And here we are in 2021 in the same, well, we're a little further down the road, but there still is no provincial plan. So that makes it really challenging. Well, the federal strategy, again, uh, it's, it's focus from our perspective was so narrow, we couldn't even qualify for it. So it made it really challenging. And then just the funding challenges. We've, I, I can tell you, we've reached out to the CRTC. We've spoken to um, one of the commissioners there. We've spoken to mis uh, ministers provincially, federally. So I've met with Minister Gublish. I've met with our local MLA. He's spoken about it in the legislature. Uh, we've met with Senator Black and Simon. Um, our MP we've met with. So we've been trying on all fronts to advocate this from a, an elector perspective and, uh, and, and we're still challenged with that and still not necessarily um, seeing all the support that, that could be there. So next slide. So this is just a little bit of a picture of, of uh, where our test pilot is now. So we learned a lot from our um, pilot or our little test at the fair. And now we are currently, as you can see, there's some symmetrical services. So we've gone to a combination. We've got fiber um, to uh, one site where we beam it out and we have these symmetrical uh, radio antennas that um, are receiving the signal so very similar to or along the lines of what Viking has. We've attached it to one of our tall grain elevators and then they can beam down the road. Um, so connected and I'm probably not using the great technical terms. I should probably have had my counselor speak to this because this is his area of passion. Um, but we are able to, uh, as you can see, get some, some good um, sections of land where we could actually provide service. The uptake initially was a little slow. Um, again, we wanted to keep the pilot small because we wanted to ensure success. So one of the things we heard from Olds when we spoke with them is you don't want to go really big and then potentially fail or not provide good service because it's really hard to gain confidence and trust back from your business sector once you've kind of put it out there and you haven't been as successful. So we started small. Um, we got some really great partnerships with our business sector in terms of attaching it to a pool on their property or attaching it to buildings. Um, so that really helped us a lot. Um, and they were kind of, well, how much do we need? Is this really going to be that great? And once they started getting the service, we really started to see some uptake from, from our business sector. So this is where we're at right now. Um, it's, uh, we're only largely right now marketing to our business tenants. As, as I said, we're trying to ensure it works. We were delayed big time with COVID. Um, our stuff got hung up in the United States. We couldn't get, got hung up in China first with COVID in the factory. Then it got hung up in, the, in Texas. Um, it took forever to get there. And then our, like we're working with a company out of the US. Um, they had difficulty coming over into Canada because of COVID. So COVID has certainly played um, a role and a, um, some barriers to us, but we seem to have gotten over a number of them. And, uh, and we have a marketing video, so I'll show you that next. We started Hooked uh, with the goal of providing reliable, cost-effective telecommunication services to the communities that need it most. Uh, those are the communities that uh, today suffer from limited or no connectivity at all. Our solution provides the coverage, reliability, and capacity that other solutions on the market today lack. Our latest deployment in Vermilion, Alberta is a perfect example of how we were able to go into a community, 
that was suffering from unreliable internet connectivity and solve all of those pain points. The average speeds that they were receiving was five down and one up. They have a hard time watching a Netflix show. Uh, they have a hard time downloading a file. And not only were they receiving low speeds, but the service providers were also charging them the same amount of money that a resident in Calgary who was receiving 100 down and 50 up would be paying. So we had done a, quite a, an extensive work on revitalizing our downtown, as you can see. And at that time, we reached out to our businesses and said, what else do we need to do to help you succeed as a business? And broadband came up. So this was kind of as pioneering as electricity at one time wasn't also what municipalities did. And then little rural electrification association started and people started to find the solution for themselves. So we said, maybe we need to find our solution. The existing internet was so poor, I actually brought my internet from home just so we could patch in and actually continue business. My estimate from the cable company was $120,000 to get uh, internet connectivity. Billing process, invoicing, and accounts receivable would take close to an hour to start up. To bring the desired connectivity solution to Vermillion, we worked with local businesses to install our proprietary Cumulo units about 1,500 to 2,000 feet apart. We spaced them throughout the community and then ran fiber to every Cumulo. They went from an average of five down and one up to speeds of between 50 up and 150 down. We already have kind of people connected and uh, the clients on the system now are very happy with the service. Really new technology, it's exciting technology for the town. So far we've had no downtime and infinitely faster than what we had got down to with our traditional internet. And with our broadband as a utility platform, what we're really trying to do here is we're trying to keep the money in the town. So the town now is the one who manages, controls and owns the network. So just like any other utility, like your sewer and your water is a self-standing utility, that's our goal. It was a way for the town to ultimately subsidize the broadband costs. This way we're able to keep those dollars in the community and it enhances the quality of life. To me, it doesn't seem to compare to the other ones. It's made my life a lot better, yes. Our resilient backhaul capabilities make providing connectivity easy, no matter how remote the location. So a little bit about the pros to high-speed broadband. Um, so this is really, again, I spoke about this a lot. This is really about business retention, keeping the businesses we have um, and, and helping them. Business expansion, helping them to grow. So we just, for example, have a new uh, the, an ag dealership who has is doing a significant expansion in our community right now. And he's already approached the town and said, I'm going to need this because even just the diagnostics required for combines. He, he said, if I have to download that, it's going to take me like a day, whereas, you know, we would be able to provide him that broadband service and it would be able to be done much quicker. And again, it, when a combine is down, um, it means business to the farmer. So this is really about helping our current businesses as well. It's about business investment and job creation. So as we look at to bring new businesses in, I've spoken a little bit about the site selectors that we had and, and one of the things that they, they ask for is uh, certainly about us to have um, that broadband connectivity. About helping us diversify our economy. So we all know as, as rural communities that uh, diversification is gonna be key as we go forward. And uh, this is really about helping uh, even our college sector. We're looking at how we can be better partners with our college um, around diversification. And then really becoming a smart community. So it's one of the things we're really um, hoping that we can do is um, eventually move towards a smart community where a lot of our infrastructure even is going to be able to just be coming downloaded into the office and we don't necessarily need to have people on the ground going around and collecting that information. Next slide. Um, some of the cons to high speed certainly have been the cost, the capital cost. If you want to do fiber to the premises, um, the upfront cost is really high, but once it's in, it's going to last uh, 50 years. I think one of the challenges that we had 
Uh, so when I think back to one of the subdivisions we developed in one of my first years as a counselor, um, I remember us talking about having to put fax lines in. I just wish we had put like bigger conduit so we could have just blown uh, internet into that subdivision now because we laid all the infrastructure for the fax ability <laughs> to that community and then had to turn it over to TELUS. And so TELUS now owns that infrastructure. So we could have had that infrastructure in place. Um, and then just the operating costs. So right now, I, I'm going to say for us, um, it's not been a, a cost. We're not at that cost effective. Some of it is because we're trialing the system and we want to make sure it's successfully working before we roll it out on a bigger plan. Um, so we are having to bear um, some of the operational costs right now. Having our community under an ISP, again, looking at cost sharing to other municipalities if we have the infrastructure in, and then really being aware of poor customer service. So we didn't really want to get into the ISP piece of it because we don't have the technical expertise. We're not the experts and we want, we want to be able to provide good quality service. So that was customer service is number is, is a key important piece to this as well. Next slide. Um, so why bother? This sounds like a lot of work. All she's talked about is all her challenges. <laughs> Again, it's getting back to that, you know, business retention and expansion. Um, this has been really, really key. Um, and if you keep doing what you've always done, you will continue to see the same results, which is the definition of insanity, right? And so we really had to say, you know what, it, it, it if we're gonna sit here and wait, like we've done for so long, then what do we need to do? Some of the keys to success I'm just gonna to speak to right here, really um, for us has been that strong desire of counsel. That has been probably the number one key driver and motivator was to have counsel totally on board. Uh, then a willing staff. And for us, we've had a really strong support from our ECDAV officer, but certainly administration in terms of supporting the staff to move this forward has been also critical. Um, then expertise. So we've certainly used Craig Dobson, but one of the other things we discovered is we actually had an expert in our community who could help with actually hooking the system up. So um, I think another really important thing, and, and we heard this, when we talked to Olds as well, was starting to develop some expertise within your community so that you can actually provide some good customer service um, really quickly, which is going to be really, you know, we all know we're very frustrated when our internet goes down and we want service. And, and probably one of the biggest comments I can certainly have from my personal experience has been the challenge with getting good customer service from the major telecoms. So if you have that service provided more local, having that uh, professional in your community is really key. Um, urgency, COVID really pushed this to the forefront and uh, has really made this a bigger priority. And then to learn and listen to the experience of others. So thank you for the invitation. I hope I'm not discouraging anyone. I hope I'm encouraging municipalities to go forward this, but you know, uh, listening to Viking story is important. We talk to olds. And so really starting to have conversations with the municipalities around what's gonna work for you. As Dawn said, there's no one good solution. This is the path that Vermillion's taking, but there's lots of different paths that you can do. And just to continue on till you get there. So with that, what's next? Next slide, uh, the town of Vermillion. Um, the, the, um, our businesses are very happy right now with the speeds that they're receiving. So they're receiving symmetrical 150, 150 up, 150 down, um, which has been working really, really well and pretty much consistent. We have that consistent level. And I mean, I, we're sometimes shooting speeds as high as 300, 350. So the business sector has been extremely happy with the service that we've been providing, which has been, uh, which is great. Um, that said, we're looking to the future. Um, you may have noticed we have an RFP right now out, um, which is closing on March the 30th. And we're looking for a partnership um, to work with a company who's willing to deploy and operate an open access broadband utility network. So we are, we are looking to the future. We know the system we have now, um, the operating costs are higher than, than we've feel is going to be sustainable in the long run. Fiber is, is truly 
I'm going to say the gold standard that we're looking at right now. And so we are continuing to move in that direction. And with that, if there's any questions. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Your Honor, for uh, for taking these questions. We have about uh, seven minutes for questions. I'm sorry about any of the uh, the issues we had with running the um, video, but we have shared it in the chat here, and and we'll absolutely send that that out uh, for people to see. Um, so, I, I if I, if I can tie into just kind of one viewpoint that I have, which is. Um, common theme that we tend to hear is, is one, uh, one size doesn't necessarily fit all. So, so um, you know, looking back at how things have deployed, are, are you feeling quite content with the, the rollout that you have thus far? Would, are there any sort of things that you would change as, as you've evolved and, and learned from this experience? I mean, ideally, if we could have stuck fiber in right from the get go, that would be awesome. Um, we, we just couldn't, we just couldn't get to that point. Um, and so uh, I think too, as the world has really changed with COVID so much more is opening up, there's more opportunities now, there's more companies out there, there's more innovation out there. So, um, you know, I think that always is the challenge when you're an early adopter or an early get out of the gate kind of, right, then, you know, the opportunities are limited, I think right now, for municipalities to start considering this, um, the operate opportunities have expanded immensely. So, you know, certainly there are um, communities like Beaumont and Leduc. And so when sometimes we think, oh, it's only us struggling, mm, Beaumont, Leduc, Stony Plain, like they're all struggling. County is, uh, uh, Sturgeon County right now has a, has a RFI out right now to look at, at opportunities. So it has become a thing, um, which is great because as more communities come on board, uh, when there's just a few of us, we have limited options. As more of us come on board, the options we can in, increase. So I, I mean, would it have been ideal? Absolutely. I don't. I just don't. I don't know what we could have done differently. And and we chose the path we did. We're we're happy with the path we chose. We've learned a ton. Um, and so sometimes you have to have to learn it before you can. You know, maybe you don't appreciate it if you don't have to learn it. I don't know. Fair enough. It's it's one of these things where I, I guess is. As we all go into these roles, as we move throughout our careers, we may not anticipate we're going to become an expert on, but, but here you are. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, da I'm a dangerous expert. <laughs> <laughs> a little knowledge, that's it. So uh, Joe has a question here. So the fiber infrastructure may last for 50 years, but how often do you need to reinvest in the ISP equipment? Okay, and that's a great question. And I will, oh gosh, I wish Rob was unmuted. I'm gonna suggest, I think it's a 10, five to 10 years, kind of depending. And it is one of the considerations that we certainly, yeah, and someone wrote typically around 10. So kind of depending on how, how you build it. I think what we were looking at is too, is there some opportunity for expandability, right? And so you have to consider that as well. Excellent. Um, one kind of final question that we'll have, and I hope if you're you're available um, for the next, I'm not sure what your schedule looks like, but if you're able to stick around for, for 15 minutes, we'll actually create a uh, Vermilion breakout room that people can go in and, and chat with you if that's okay. Um, yeah, as long as you want my counselor or net dev officer in the, in the room, <laughs> then we can have, you know, like a, a real chat, a real conversation. Excellent. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just, as a sort of a final question, could you talk about the importance of having champions? You talked about one of your city councillors who's kind of led on this. And, and mm -hmm. I think sometimes when these things happen, you need champions on the issue. So yeah. could you elaborate a little bit more on this? For sure. So uh, actually, if you look up uh, ProSize uh, change theory model, um, it, it really talks about having that collective of, of champions. And I think because it's really easy, as you can hear, to get discouraged in the journey and go, oh, I don't think we can do this. I think we have to stop. I think, right, there's lots of that because it's the fear of the unknown. We're all comfortable with water and garbage and sewer. But this, this, like, no, 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 this is somebody else. No, no, we, we shouldn't be doing this. Now we're treading in someone else's territory, right? It's really easy to get discouraged. And we had to honestly continue to say nope if not us then who if not now then when right it's not like it's gonna uh, like in 10 years 
what would that mean to Vermilion? And when we spoke to one of the major telecoms, they said, yeah, we could do you in, I don't know, six to seven years. And we were like, oh my goodness, we'll be dead by then. The other thing to, act, to recognize is that there are two communities in rural Alberta. They're both towns. I'm not gonna get, tell you where. They live, they are 25 kilometers apart from each other. One has broadband, the other does not. The house values are $15,000 more in the community with broadband. And the telecoms know this. They know this, they know they are adding value. So it, this isn't even just about the service delivery. This actually has an impact on the saleability of the homes in your community, the businesses in your community. This is, this is more than I like to watch Netflix. Fascinating. Well, that's a great note to add, end on. So your honor, thank you so much for joining us here and, and sharing the Vermilion story with, with everyone here. Um, so anyways, it, I think this is quite fitting given some of the comments that came from the, the mayor of Vermilion uh, to invite Rob Schneider, who spent 25 years with the government of Alberta before moving to Strathcona County as director of IT and a project director. He is now the manager of information services for Sturgeon County, which has drawn quite a bit of attention for its recent, recent connectivity initiatives. Rob, welcome to uh, the forum. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. I, I have a, a screen or a presentation to share, so I'll try and bring it up now. Um, just give me a moment here. Okay, we'll try it again. Okay, uh, hopefully that's working and you can all see the, the presentation. So I, I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon. The mayor had wanted to be here to present this herself, but unfortunately she couldn't make it. So I hope I do her justice. Hey Rob, sorry to interject. I, I can't see the presentation, but if you'd like, I have it loaded on my end. So, oh, there that? we go. It's it's now popped up. We got it now. Okay, great, thanks. Sorry about that, I missed the button. Uh, and, and sorry, go ahead. We can now see it perfectly. Okay, I'm having trouble getting advancing. It's a little slow. Okay, here we go. So first of all, welcome uh, Sturgeon County's uh, is a very diverse. We have some heavy industrial. We share the Alberta industrial heartland with Strathcona County. Agribusiness is big, big on families uh, and agriculture, of course. So a lot, lot going on in the county. Uh, if you're not familiar with the county, it's located immediately north of Edmonton and St. Albert. Uh, and you can see at a glance, one of our problems are about three times the size of the city of Edmonton and one one thousandth of the population density. So uh, certainly one of our challenges. Uh, this is a, a, a thing we use to show, this is a pre-COVID slide that shows uh, why broadband is important. You can see from a municipality why it's important. Uh, very biz important from a business perspective and Sturgeon County is very supportive of, of business. And, and of course, uh, from a residential point of view, it's also important. And, and that's the part that's really become much more urgent as COVID and people started working from home. Uh, and, and we believe that's a trend that will continue uh, for years to come. So at a glance, here's the problem we're having. And, and you, you heard it with the, the mayor uh, Mayor McCauley as well is uh, uh, this is the reality on the ground. This is our, our Sierra speed test map. Uh, if you see an area in dark blue, uh, that meets the minimum federal standards. So you're seeing that a little bit in the southernmost part of the county. Uh, this is the Mournville area, not technically not part of the county and, and Gibbons as well. Uh, but this is what we're dealing with. So dark red is, is less than seven megabits per second. 
uh, and the county average is just over 11 megabits per second. So um, it's a real challenge uh, and, and uh, something that uh, our residents are and businesses are, are asking us to do something about. So our challenges, I would describe them as too close yet too far, although I'm starting to rethink that after hearing that Vermilion has very much the same challenges and, and uh, is not as close to Edmonton as we are. Uh, but we're too close to urban areas to qualify for grants and are too far from urban areas to interest the private sector. Uh, we've tried a, a number of approaches. We've tried, there's SuperNet, of course, that helped some with the public sector but it didn't deliver on the last mile. Uh, connecting Canadians, Sturgeon didn't qualify. UBF, Sturgeon doesn't qualify. And for very much the reasons, if you've been following the chat, is, is that there's over-reporting of speed capabilities and uh, that tends to disqualify us, even though from the map uh, of our speed tests, there's, there's certainly a need in the county. And, and finally, most ISPs are reluctant to invest in, in, a, in a low density area like Sturgeon County. So we, we did a survey last fall and I wanted to quickly hit some of the highlights of it. We, we had a residential survey and a business survey. So here's some of the stats. We asked how important is internet to you? And you can see from the, the home point of view, uh, over 60% can't live without it. Another 35% or so very important. So almost 100% that it's very important or critical to have good internet at home. At the business side below, you can see it's even more so, almost 70% critical to crucial to the business, 30%, uh, so just under 100% again, very important or crucial to their business. Satisfaction levels on the other hand aren't keeping up. So you can see the reliability uh, you can see that uh, over half of the people on, at the residential level believe that uh, the service is not uh, reliable and uh, almost two thirds that it's not fast enough. And at the business level, it's even even worse. The almost two, over two thirds feel that it's uh, not reliable enough and almost three quarters feel that they don't have the speed that they need to succeed. So uh, a very, it's a lot of, uh, interest in, in doing better. Uh, we, uh, the mayor talked a little bit about, uh, about uh, some of the economic impacts, and this is some of the economic impacts from, and this is from the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board. They did a broadband situation analysis that includes Sturgeon County. So you can see with our average speed of 10.3 megabits, uh, their estimates is that if that increased to 50 megabits, it would increase the economic or the GDP in Sturgeon County by $2.7 million a year. If we had 100 megabits, that would go up to $5.4 million a year. And I can imagine that if it was gigabit or in that range, it'd be even faster. From a home thing, as, as the mayor, as Mayor McCauley referenced, it has a definite impact. According to this report, it affects a, a house price of about $12,000 uh, per home. And uh, on the wish list for new homes, it was number two, right behind laundry rooms. So uh, high-speed broadband is really important uh, for people trying and looking at where to move and, and where to live. Uh, we, we think we have a great lifestyle in Sturgeon County, and we're, we're hoping that we, we can uh, hit that number two on it as well uh, and, uh, and increase interest in the county. You can also see from a business perspective, I, I won't go through it, but the, the EMRB report looked at the impacts on various business sectors as well. So, so a lot to be, to be gained. The last stat I'll throw at you is we also asked them, what should the role of the county be? This is, and we asked, the residences we, we asked, and you can see it was non low, medium and high. And, and if you add the medium and highs together, uh, you're, you're looking at almost 90% uh, of residents who are saying that the county should help to resolve this by making investments uh, in broadband. And at the business level, it was even higher. It was above 90% that the, the county should be making investments to improve broadband. So, so our council uh, took that information in. They asked, uh, what can we do about that? and uh, we've been helping them find some solutions. 
one of the things we proposed, and this is a difficult to read map, so, so hopefully you, you can uh, navigate around it, is we broke the county into six areas and we suggested that we take a phased approach because each it is, it is a big county and each one of these six areas is close to the size of the city of Edmonton. So uh, we have, this, we call this area phase one, there's a phase two, which includes the industrial heartland area outside Port Saskatchewan. Uh, there's area three, area four, area five, and then finally area six down here. Uh, so, so we broke the county in six, and we're proposing a six phase plan to implement a broadband solution. Uh, the first area being a pilot area. And, and it kind of looks like this. So this is the Southwest corner of the county. Uh, this is a, a shows uh, where the broadband might go. This, this, particular, this is not our final broadband layout. It was done for estimating purposes and, uh, and to try and figure out some of the intricacies. So you can see how the broadband might go through the, this area of the county to connect these various homes up. Uh, we're, we're having some discussions about some of these challenging areas here, like there's some golf course here, a golf course there, and, and discussions. Uh, we, our direction is to include all uh, subdivisions, hamlets, uh, community centers, industrial parks, and, and there's some debate whether a golf course is considered a community center or not, but uh, we'll leave that as it is. Uh, that, that's one of the, the things that we're working on and an idea of how we might uh, service our, our phase one area. I wanted to spend a bit of time Look, talking about the business model, you, you, you've heard uh, uh, Don, Don McLeod and, and Mayor McCauley talk about the business models they used. And this is the business model we're proposing. Uh, I say proposing because as Mayor McCauley mentioned, we have an RFI out right now and that RFI is asking questions because we want to feedback from the vendor community, feedback from other people who are interested in this topic on uh, helping us design the best business model and the best deployment model. So from a business model point of view, we're, we're suggesting that the Sturgeon County uh, does not want to operate an ISP. We don't want day-to-day -day involvement, uh, but we are willing to invest up to $7.3 million in capital for this phase one area. And we are willing to give uh, access to our property and our rights of way uh, where we can to facilitate uh, a fiber to the premises network. Uh, in return for that, uh, we wanna be able to set service expectations. Uh, we wanna make sure that the, the, the service, it's a good service, a fast service, and it's an affordable service. So uh, that's kind of what we're expecting out of this in return for our money. Uh, we want to own the fiber. Uh, so that uh, we have a hard asset in return for our investment. Uh, on the back end, I want to let you know we're debt financing that. So uh, the, that uh, debt financing is very low for municipalities right now. So we can get a very good rate on that. Uh, and it helps to spread the payments across uh, the, provides what we call intergenerational equity. So, so it's not today's taxpayer who's paying for 100% of it. Over the next 20 years, uh, people will be paying off the fiber and all contributing to, to its initial deployment. Uh, and, and the big thing, and you talk about business cases a lot, uh, the county realizes there, there is not a positive dollar business case in there. We don't intend to make money. Uh, if you look at our road system, for example, the county invests millions and millions of dollars in roads every year without an expectation of return. Uh, we expect to get some return, uh, from, but we certainly don't expect this to be a cash positive venture. It's part of our role as a municipality in, in providing for the greater good. So to get this done, uh, we're envisioning uh, partnering with what, what, I, we, what I call a builder operator. This is a, a company that will build the network and they'll operate it. So they're in charge of construction, network operations and maintenance of the network, of the fiber network itself. Uh, so we're gonna be partnering with them. We're expecting them to make a capital contribution as well. Uh, and then the, the third part of this is the retail ISP. So 
what the approach we're taking to retail is to encourage competition, encourage any uh, ISP that wants to retail our service, our fiber service to do so. Uh, we have five ISPs in the county right now, uh, and uh, they've all expressed interest in, in uh, retailing our, our fiber to the premises service, and in some cases of hooking their towers into the broadband network if we can provide it cost effectively. So. Uh, there's some, so there's something in it for that. That's not a tightly regulated part of the partnership. Uh, we're expecting uh, competition to help out there. We're expecting them to use services to to uh, distinguish themselves. Like some may be pure data only. Some may um, go for a triple play where they're including television or phone service. Some may uh, be looking at home automation or home security services. Uh, that's how they can differentiate themselves for, for uh, all selling the same, essentially fiber to the premises network. From a financial perspective, you have the, the retail customer, of course, paying for the service. Uh, the retailer gets that, they take care of the billing, they take care of all the customer service aspects of it. Uh, and they pay the builder operator a wholesale network fee uh, to, to get on the network for each customer. And, uh, and the builder operator in return gives us an access fee to, to have a, for that uh, subscriber to have access to the network. So that's kind of the way the, the financials flow back uh, after our initial investment. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to do is quickly hit our process. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we just issued an RFI. That's the market sounding phase of our project. So we just uh, a couple of weeks ago finished the market research phase. This is where we talk to ISPs and others in the community about, uh, about uh, the model that we had in mind and, and is it workable and, and got some, uh, some interest from them. Uh, now we're in the market sounding, which is the RFI process. Uh, after that, we have uh, a couple of weeks set aside for commercially confidential meetings. If there's any vendors that want to have a, a non-disclosure agreement to get, to get more into the details of their responses. Uh, then we have a partner acquisition process, which is uh, an RFP, essentially uh, officially looking for that partner. Uh, and it'll be refined, of course, based on the RFI feedback we get and then a contract negotiation. Uh, uh, we've talked to other people who have done similar projects and that's a big part of it. That's uh, where we get to set out our standards, our expectations, our service levels, and things like that. So a big part of that. So lots of work ahead of us, uh, but we're on that path. Uh, but, so that's it, uh, just uh, short and sweet. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time and interest. And thanks for all those towns that, and, and counties that went ahead of us and, and blazed the roadmaps and uh, or blazed ahead and showed us uh, where we should go. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Rob, for, for bringing your perspective um, to, to, the, uh, to the panel here as well, too. So for those who are joining us, if you have any questions, um, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, one of the first ones that I've gotten here would be, uh, which companies have expressed interest in it to your RFP? I'm not sure if you're able to tell us this. Um, I know that some well, of these tenderings are a bit restrictive, but. Yeah, certainly I, I can. You can probably check yourself. So it's posted to Alberta Purchasing Connection. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we just put it up yesterday, so I haven't gone on to see who's downloaded. We, we our, our operators in the county right now, uh, we have TELUS, ExploreNet, uh, ClearWave, AlbertaCom, and MCSNet. We've all expressed interest in, in, in responding to it. Uh, and we're also hoping that other, other people from across and even people who aren't vendors, uh, we're trying to learn we're trying to get feedback on a model. So if uh, you yourself are interested, even if you're another municipality or, or a consultant in the area, uh, we'd certainly appreciate the feedback on it. But uh, so, so I don't know, but it is public information who's downloaded the RFI 
Uh, we won't know who's actually submitted responses uh, until for a couple more weeks. But I also want to emphasize uh, this: these aren't proposals. That's later. This is just here's our business model. What do you think? Is it going to work? What would you change? Um, uh, does this idea of money flowing back from the retailer to the wholesaler to the county, does that work? Uh, how much do you think the county will have to uh, inject into, into this partnership to make it work? All, all those kinds of questions. Erickson, Phil had a question which uh, says, do you have a varying price structure or is it same for all? Uh, I, I don't know the answer for that. to that. I mean, you probably won't know until the RFP is done. So we might get some ideas on the RFI when people make some suggestions as to how the money might flow back. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. It'll, it'll be up to specific proposal. In the, in the RFP phase, the, the, the partner will have to say how they would envision that to work. And then through contract negotiations, we'll finalize that. Um, the, the, I'm expecting the price structure uh, at the wholesale level will vary. I, I'm expecting that at our level, the county, it'll be a standard access fee. But, uh, uh, but I, I don't know for sure until we get further down the road. Fair enough. Uh, Campbell asks, uh, what was the basis or source for this idea? Yeah, great. Uh, I'd like to give a shout out actually to Red Deer County. They, they were very, a pivotal in providing us uh, with their information on how they did it. Uh, and we've had a, a few meetings with them now on the pros and cons of their model, what they would change and things like that. So they have a very similar approach. The, we, we differ at how we treat retailers uh, is, is the main way, but uh, very similar approach and it's been quite successful as well. We've also talked to Brooks. They, they, they're doing some interesting work as well in that area, although not as applicable. Excellent. Um, I would love for, you know, you, you spoke about owning the fiber or owning the asset. Uh, I would love for you to elaborate a little bit more about the importance of, of that and kind of what was the inspiration surrounding the, the ownership yeah. of that. Well, there, there's two reasons. That's a really good question. The, the first reason is that it's, uh, it's challenging to spend $7 million plus and not have nothing to show for it. Uh, you know, it, it feels like you're a lot more secure having an asset for it. The other thing is that the debt financing we're using is, is based on capital expenses. So mm -hmm. if we didn't own the fiber, I'm not sure we would qualify for that debt financing. So we deal with that as well. And, and the last part is, is Red Deer County's uh, experience and, and it gives you that certainty that if um, if the partnership breaks down or you get to the end of the partnership uh, after you know five years ten years or however long that is uh, you have that enduring asset that you can then take forward to your next arrangement it's not going the need for broadband's not going away it's forever so it gives you something that can, you can carry from uh, from contract to contract yeah, I guess it gives you that certainty because realistically, like, and not to say anyone's going to be malicious here, but, you know, if a company goes insolvent, you're technically, if you don't own the asset, your your uh, residents having uh, access to high-speed internet could be reliant on solely the the merits of how bankruptcy court <laughs> rolls out realistically. Yeah, I'd hate to be the one for counsel to tell them I need another $7 million because we blew the first part in the year one. Excellent. Um, Irwin has a question uh, specific to you being theoretically the owner of, of sub broadband uh, asset. Are, are you subjected to any CRTC regulations or, or any uh, regulations that the crowd should be aware of? I don't know the answer to that, Irwin. Um, I, I'm going based solely on my experience talking to other, other people who've done this, and, and I don't believe they're subject to CRTC regulations or they don't think they are so I don't I don't think we are just having fiber in the ground is an asset I don't think and you're not operating it that's the partner who does that and it's not your equipment that's on the end that's the partner's equipment I'm not sure that would make a subject to CRTC yeah uh, I know that a lot of conversations spur specifically around future proofing um, urban development or, or county development um, 
you know, in earlier conversations where there's talks about city of Calgary and how they've laid dark fiber, is this changing the way that, um, that your county is now doing urban planning? And, and as you grow or develop new areas, are you taking this into consideration as you do your developments? No, I'm not seeing that, at least not at this early stage. Uh, there are big plans for uh, a new town, if you want to call it that, or area in the southern part, uh, right near St. Albert there, that I'm sure will use this. But no, it's not affecting our, our planning per se. And, and it's one of our challenges right now. To uh, I saw other people talking about you should bear ray fiber whenever you open a trench. We've, we, we've found challenges with that. I mean, we have the, um, we're putting in a new water line and we thought it would make sense to put fiber in and, and uh, our utilities people bristled at putting fiber in the same trench and all kinds of reasons why it's a bad idea. Uh, our, our engineering people on our roads, they haven't quite warmed up to that yet as well. So, so we have some more work to do in that area for sure. Uh, excellent. Is the 7.3 million the cost of laying the fiber? Is that how uh, you expect to own the fiber? It, it, do you potentially see like that's the overlying cost or is there going to be other added costs to that? The, the 7.3 was done from an early estimate of how much we anticipated it would cost to lay the fiber. So we did an early estimate of that and we took that to council because we wanted to make sure that they were truly behind this project. We didn't want to do all this work, you know, without that certainty there. And, and uh, when we told them that number, they, they didn't blink. I think they passed, the, uh, gave us the motion to proceed was unanimous, I think. Uh, the debt bylaw is uh, still out on the street. So uh, the, way, the way the debt bylaw works is we have to uh, do first reading, we have to advertise it. Uh, and then uh, if people disagree, they can come to council or put together a petition against it. And uh, that'll be settled on April 23rd, I think. So that's when we'll have that money. Now, I should say, we hope we don't spend 723 million. I'm, I'm hoping the partner will kick in a lot and, and we can do much less because then we can start looking at phases two and phases three and, and things like that. We want to accelerate that as fast as possible. So, but, uh, but yeah, that was where we got the initial estimates from. Yeah, well, and you probably banked that on uh on the US dollar being what it was when you first brought to council, which has seen a little bit of an influx too. So you might win yeah, from that side. Might help. Um, to, speaking on sort of a technical side of things, I know it's sometimes hard for counties and municipalities to assume debt. Um, what's kind of the difference um, for this asset as opposed to other uh, times that a municipality might try to uh, assume a debt? Well, I, I think part of it goes to um, the county itself, they've been very careful to incur debt or reduce their reliance on debt. So they have quite a large debt limit. So when, when they're faced with this issue where, where, the, where the residents and the businesses are looking for solutions and, and other levels of government just aren't providing that and, and, and it, it came forward. And as I mentioned, it provides that intergenerational equity in that uh, by borrowing the money, we're paying it back over you know, 20 years or 25 years, whatever we think is appropriate. Uh, interest rates are really low, so there's not much of a cost impact to doing that. So it just seemed to make sense. Excellent. Is the uh, is the overall plan to run fiber to every home, or are you um, running it down the street and then the homeowners may be responsible for that final I, I, amount? Well, there, there's two aspects of it. First of all, every home. Uh, so when we first were looking at it, we were looking at the, po the, the possibility of providing it to every home, like even a farmyard half a mile from the next farmyard. Uh, but uh, un unfortunately, that proved to not be a, a model we could, we could sustain. So now we've gone to the, the definition of the higher density area. So that's, that, as I mentioned, includes all country residential subdivisions, hamlets, industrial parks, community centers, uh, municipal buildings for that matter. Uh, so that's our current one. Uh, the, the other aspect may, it may be how close are we getting to those homes? And the current proposal in the RFI is that we go right to the building. So it includes going from the road 
uh, to any building. And I think we set a limit of 150 meters. So if you're within 150 meters of the, of the fiber line, uh, we'll run it up to, to your house and uh, curl it up there. Uh, that's to try and uh, encourage uh, as much adoption as we can. Because remember, the county isn't looking at how to optimize its return on its investment. It's looking at how to help as many people as possible. So, so we're looking at going right, right up to, to houses. So, um, you know, if, if I, I know you've looked at sort of the comparative models of what Red Deer County has done and what the County of Brooks or, or the Town of Brooks has, Brooks. has done. Um, you know, if, if you were to give advice to another sort of Alberta County or town, um, as they sort of launch this this venture, as as you've started to sort of see some lessons learned, and as as the RFP continues to move forward, what what would you advise them to do, um, especially if if given that you've been at the starting point of this too? I, I a couple of things. One is density is really important. There's a big difference between Brooks and Sturgeon County, for example. Brooks is a much higher density area, so. Uh, they, they certainly have a lot more options. They have options around 5G uh, and, and things like that that we don't have. Their cost per premises would be a lot lower as well. So um, whether they're fiber or, or radio. So, so quite a different scenario. Uh, I would certainly think they should take a look at what 5G can do it, or maybe fiber to the home. Um, they could also look at maybe if their county's interested, uh, they can look at partnerships. We've had discussions with uh, the towns that uh, are within the county borders and they're all very interested. If we're bringing fiber right near their place, I, I think that gives them the opportunity to join in and, you know, in a partnership later and expand it to their area. So I'd certainly check with the county. Uh, if your county doing it, um, it, it's really difficult to throw that much money at broadband and, and it really depends on your council. If your council is um, roads, 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 that's the most important thing in a county and it's count, roads are really important in counties. Uh, if, if that's what it's all about uh, and they don't see broadband, I don't, I don't know if you'll get them willing to invest that much. But uh, if you have a, a council that, that really sees that this is, this is what they have to do and that other levels of government aren't going to jump in and bail them and the private sector is not come in and bail them, that they need to incentivize the private sector because that's essentially what we're doing. We're incentivizing the private sector to, to build in our area. Uh, this, this could be a very good model. I'll know more later, but I think uh, based on Red Deer County, it's looking quite positive. Excellent. Um, how do you get that council buy-in? I think that's uh, the golden um, root sort I, of I question think the, there. I, I think it was the other way around. Uh, council came to us and they said, uh, this, this, they're hearing from all the residents. Well, I should back up a little bit. It used to be the businesses that they'd hear from, the business saying that, you know, I, my, I can't be successful because, because this high speed is important or, or I'm an online auction and I can't get good service to, to auction you know, my, my tractors or my livestock on and, and uh, you're gonna push me out of the county. That, that used to be what they heard. Uh, then when COVID hit, it switched and it became very resi residential in nature is that my kids are trying to learn and I'm trying to run my, my do my work and, and, uh, and, and this isn't working. And uh, greenhouses in the county said we're having to pivot because uh, of COVID, and we can't because the pivoting involves using the internet more. So all that came to them. So I, I would say they came to us and said we have this problem. Uh, how how would administration suggest we solution? And that's when we started looking at the various models. We looked at the SWIFT model in Ontario, the Red Deer County model, the Brooks model. And a number of models uh, and, and until we found some that we thought might work for the county. And then we went back to council and we said, well, here's, here's some models that may work and this is what they landed. Excellent, fascinating. Well, Rob, um, uh, another question that we've gotten here is, uh, what is the position of the school boards, healthcare providers and lower tier municipalities to become anchor tenants on the network, i.e rotating off of incumbent telecom networks when their contracts are up? 
Yeah, and we, we haven't had any discussions with school boards. They have SuperNet already, uh, which may or may not be providing their, their needs. Uh, healthcare providers are generally in the towns, not in the rural areas, so they, they'd be out of scope for us. Uh, lower tier, I presume in this case, you mean the towns. Uh, the towns are very interested, uh, but there's no need for them to, to be partners at this point. They're, they're taking a wait and see approach. Uh, and there's other options for them. There are other um, there are other 5G solutions coming as well. So they're going to have decisions later on. And do they want to uh, uh, maybe work with the county and our partner to put in fiber to their premises, uh, which some of the towns in Red Deer County have done? Or do they want to uh, use the 5G services that, that some of the ISPs in that community might offer? Perfect. Well, Rob, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, it's, it's been a, a great perspective. And, and I think you know, you're very good at tying it in around taking inspiration from, from other, uh, other subsets and other sectors. So, so I appreciate you joining us here. So with that being said, we will, uh, we're now going to jump to our final uh, presentation of the day, which is the crisis of connectivity within First Nation communities. Uh, I would like to introduce our uh, moderator for today, which is Rob McMahon. Rob is an associate professor in Media and Technology Studies Unit and the Department of Political Science at the University of Alberta. Uh, Rob, I'll, I'll invite yourself to, to introduce yourself and then the panelists joining you here today. Great, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, we used to joke half the people involved in rural uh, broadband in Alberta are either a Bob or a Rob, so <laughs> one more Rob on deck here. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome, everyone. Um, joining from Treaty 6 territory at the University of Alberta. Really happy to moderate our, uh, our last panel today. Um, so I can see uh, Eula's there. Uh, I guess maybe I'll I'll have the panelists introduce one another as they're joining. Um, so maybe we'll start with uh, Eula Shirt from Picani. So Eula, uh, if you could just please introduce yourself and then um, tell us a little bit about the work you do. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eula Shirt. I'm a member of Picani Nation based in Southern Alberta, about 45 minutes from the US border. I've been involved in connectivity for 20 plus years now, uh, working in my home community. Uh, networking and access have been my biggest concerns, uh, trying to make sure that there's internet access for the people here and so that they can participate in economic development, education, and stuff like that. Um, worked with Pagan Board of Education, working with Bikani Youth and Education Foundation now. I've uh, been part of several projects, pilot projects and stuff like that for Wi-Fi in our community uh, going way back. And uh, that's, I guess, my short introduction. I guess the next person up would be Penny. Hi, Penny. Oh, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> Well, a good start <laughs> for the end of the day. <clears throat> good afternoon. My name is Penny Carpenter, and I'm the director of Kakanan Network here in Silicaut, Ontario. Silicaut is in northwestern Ontario, and we are the hub of the remote communities uh, in the north. Um, so we've been, Silicaut has been servicing the north for many years. Um, so what we do is provide uh, broadband to the North and to other uh, First Nations communities across Ontario. Uh, we've been doing this since the late 90s, uh, you know, fighting with dial-up at the beginning, moving to T1 technology, C-band satellite for the hard to reach sites. And now we we're, have some fiber in 20 of our communities. So, um, but, even with fiber, the issue is the lack of capacity on that fiber run. So, you know, there is still lots of challenges. Like when you think you got it, it's still there's a next, the next day is like, oh, we need to do this now. So, yeah, so I'm, uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel. Thanks, Penny and uh, Ron. There it goes. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Minx. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Enoch Cree Nation. I've been back in my community uh, now about six years. Uh, prior to that, I worked in a number of other uh, commercial businesses, um, uh, primarily dealing with uh, environmental uh, issues and testing. And um, the, the, the need for uh, data was critical for, for those business to operate and the need for being able to transmit those data was critical for those businesses to survive. And it's no different than a community who needs uh, the, the connectivity to um, be able to get information in and, and to and share information. So there's a number of uh, reasons why we are working very hard on increasing our uh, com community connectivity back out into the world. And um, I'll share some of the, the, the uh, challenges that we face as we go. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ron. And what I think I'll do, because there are uh, three of you on the panel, um, I'll ask questions and then maybe I'll, I'll kind of, you know, point to people as I see you on the screen and kind of pick up threads uh, as you, um, you know, it's too bad we're doing this virtually in some ways, but we'll try and, you know, make it more of a conversational type of style. So I hope that's okay with all. So Ron, I did want to pick up about, um, you know, what you're talking about with the challenges. And of course, this, this, panel being called the crisis of connectivity within First Nations communities. And I'm wondering if maybe you could start with that, just picking up on what you were saying on, in terms of some of the ways that, that your community experiences that crisis of connectivity. Yeah, you know, Enoch is uh, right next door to a big city, city of Edmonton. And you would think that being so close to all of the infrastructure that the city enjoys, that uh, Enoch would have um, easy access to that. And it's not the case. It's very much not the case. Um, very recently, we've, uh, we had written a, a, an MOU with the City of Edmonton to work on economic development um, projects and, and things that uh, we've always been left out of the conversation on. And now we're, much, we're at the table for many of those things. And one of them is, uh, is, is communications as well. But um, where, we, where we struggle with uh, access and the internet and cell phones is that all of the infrastructure is out and around our community. Um, the, the providers have, for some reason, um, their reasons, chose to put their towers on the perimeter outside of our community. And uh, the only real fiber ac access that we ever had was provided by the SuperNet. And it's because we have a, a, a K to 12 school and a health center. And that was really all we had for connectivity. And, you know, with the, uh, the, the thankful assistance of uh, Aero Technologies through TSAG, we were able to get some Wi-Fi connections through their towers. But that was pretty limited too. It's, you know, five up and one down or whatever. Uh, that's the other way around. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're operating uh, a, a fairly sophisticated uh, operation like we have, that just doesn't work for us. And, um, you know, when you're on a tower uh, getting access to the internet, everyone shares that broadband, that, that's that network. Uh, and so when everybody's on it, it bogs down to dial up speed. Um, so you can't really do business at all. And, uh, you know, with some of the, the grants that we were able to access, uh, we were able to actually create our own dark fiber within our village area, which connects a few of our key buildings for, um, for setting up a command center, two command centers in the event of emergency. And that's the only reason we were able to access these, uh, these funds was because of that, uh, that purpose. Otherwise, we couldn't get help from, um, from uh, INAC or, or ISC now. We couldn't get help from any of the uh, government agencies. We couldn't get help from any of the providers. So, you know, even though we're right here next to a major uh, city, we were getting the same uh, level of service as if we were remote in Northern Alberta. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a challenge that we've been facing. 
No, thanks so much. Yeah, um, I I'm, I'm really glad you highlighted that aspect of being so close to an urban center. I wanted to turn to Eula next, actually, in southern Alberta, um, a little bit more of a rural area. Can you tell us maybe about the, the crisis of connectivity in Pagani? Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, a lot of it is, is somewhat similar. I mean, we're right on Highway 3. And, you know, when they put in Supernet, it came into the high school. And then it goes to some of our major departments, like the Health Center, the RCMP, uh, Public Works and stuff like that. But the problem that we've been seeing, especially over the last year, has been that we don't have connectivity for residences within our community. And, you know, that's what we're seeing the biggest challenge with right now, especially when, um, you know, like education went online for K to 12, you know, the school's got high speed internet, but nobody can access this, the classes from home, right? So that's one of our like major challenges right now is making sure that we can try and get more people on, um, you know, I guess democratize access to the internet down here, hey? No, thanks so much. And then Penny, I know you work with some fly-in communities as well. Um, how, how are you uh, experiencing this challenge in your context? Oh. I'll go from the beginning. Um, so in the late 90s, like we we're in the remote area. It's an area where telcos weren't building out. They weren't going to be providing the service. So when it came, like our broadband actually started through our education program. Our, our education advisor wanted to send files to the teachers in the north and she couldn't. So she was sending the floppy disk on the plane to the teachers to open. So, you know, we started thinking that we needed to plan broadband to the communities. And at that time, I didn't even know the word broadband. I didn't really know what it meant, but we just knew that the, the schools needed to be connected like the schools in the, in the cities and towns around us. So that was kind of the kickstart of our um, planning of broadband. Uh, Bell was our monopoly in our area, it is a monopoly in Northwestern Ontario. So they weren't looking to invest. So we did go to funders to start building the infrastructure. And at the time it was T1 technology. And then we were able to get a bigger project in 2000 to start building out the network a bit more and connecting more sites. And, and so the most Northern site we have is Fort Severn along Hudson Bay. So we did C-band satellite connection and that's what they still use today. Is C-band because it's too expensive right now to build fiber to their community. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I think like in the 20 years of delivering uh, internet or broadband to communities, um, whenever we want to build on it, add more capacity, it's really, it's not the telco that's saying, oh, it's worthwhile, we're, we're making money off of this. It's more we have to go to the funder, different funding bodies, apply for funding and build it piecemeal by piecemeal. And that's kind of what we have done in the last couple of years. Um, I just want to throw in that our model really, because the communities are remote and we we're building up the infrastructure to bring it into the community. We also worked with the community so they could develop their own ISP and deliver internet to the homes and to their health center school and band office and develop their own business in the community. And that model is still there today after 20 years. And in most cases, it, it, you know, there's some challenges in some communities, but it does work and it's uh, successful, creates jobs in the community and they're main, able to maintain the cable plants and the wireless connections. Great, thanks. Um, so I wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, pick up on something because I noticed both um, Ron and Eula nodding when you're talking about capacity and sort of the challenge in order to access that capacity paired with what, what I think we're hearing is a lot of demand from communities, particularly during, during COVID. So Eula, or uh, maybe start with Eula. Do you, did you want to add anything in terms of that, the, the sort of COVID impacts on demand and or capacity that you can access? Um, well, yeah, I mean, with COVID, you know, right off the bat, like I was saying, education put a big strain on, um, I guess, existing connectivity out there, right? Um, and capacity, I mean, like the wi Wi-Fi we had and stuff like that, it's working pretty good. But um, of course, like Ron was saying, you get lots of people on there, it tends to slow down and start gapping out a little bit. Uh, for capacity and stuff like that, one of the big things that um, 
has always been kind of a pet peeve for me is a lack of capacity in terms of uh, people on the ground in these communities that can help with connectivity and stuff like that. So actual personnel, like in the communities, um, uh, provision for funding for positions like that, local positions where people of you know the internet access and the infrastructure and stuff like that within the community that can help you know on the ground you don't have to fly somebody in you don't have to wait for somebody to drive down the next day or something like that right so that would be you know one of my biggest wish lists i guess for, to help us out fantastic thanks ron did you want to pick up on that at all like either bandwidth capacity or local technical capacity yeah we um we struggle with the bandwidth capacity because uh, all of our residents uh, are basically utilizing the service providers that have very low levels of bandwidth that they provide. And that's been a real struggle for especially our kids, um, you know, with them learning from home, uh, classes being conducted uh, over the internet. Um, you know, I had a personal experience with my granddaughter. Uh, doing her classes from um, from out on the reserve. She had her, her classes are back in the city and they have a, a policy that you have to have your video on so they know you're actually there. But with uh, restricted bandwidth and limitations with using video, she had to turn it off so she could hear what was being said and they wouldn't allow her to attend uh, the class because her video was not. So, you know, these, these, these problems that we're talking about aren't just small issues for our communities. They are going to impact us over generations. And when our kids are falling behind in school because of the limited access to data to, to, to sit in on the, the classes and to, and to stay caught up with the curriculum is going to impact them uh, not only now, but you know, further down through through their um, their schooling. So that's just one example of the impact that uh, COVID has had. Um, you know, we've we've also had other issues where even a meeting like this, um, it, you know, we 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 kind of joke with each other, but it's not really much of a joke when one person is talking, but we can't hear them because they're they they sound like a robot drowning in the water. And it's because we, we, well, you got the res internet. So everybody gets it who lives out there, but others don't realize that it's a real impact in us being productive. I want to pick up on what you're saying about some people seem to get it, some people don't. It kind of falls into that communication or engagement aspect of it. Does anyone, uh, maybe Penny, did you want to speak at all to sort of the engagement piece, um, communicating some of these challenges to policymakers, to, uh, uh, you know, large telcos. Oh, sorry, you're... Uh... Someone has to manage that mute button for me, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I think um, for 20 years, we definitely have, edu like even being in Northwestern Ontario, like people in Toronto and people in Ottawa where our governments are located, they don't always understand the challenges we face in a small rural town like Silicon, and then definitely don't understand the remoteness of what, you know, a remote community and the challenges they face. So it's, yeah, so from the very beginning, we have always invited uh, government officials to come visit our community, uh, lots of briefing notes, a lot of presentations, just to get them on board and understand, like it's very important that we, we're doing that. And then um, and lucky enough, we were able to um, belong, now belong to a first mile consortium of First Nation network networks across Canada. So we can share ideals together, share our best practices, but also work together on issues and, uh, um, and present to committees like CRTC on like best pricing or basic pricing or whatever they're, they're uh, studying at the time. Because we need to have our voices heard, not, you know, for us First Nations, we need our voices heard. But I know rural towns also need their voices heard because 
like people in cities, they really sometimes don't understand the challenges we face. You know, if it's connectivity or hydro or uh, anything like healthcare, <laughs> like, like to understand even why we need like telemedicine in a community or um, internet high schools or better connectivity in the homes and like everyone wants to believe that it's going to happen because of the uh, our business model and all the telcos are out there, you know, they're going to fight over, you know, getting the best service somewhere because, you know, they, they see, um, you know, it's an area they're going to make money. We definitely live in areas where they don't make money. So that's why we don't get the best service. So we have to keep fighting to bring that forward. Thanks, Jan. I saw Eula nodding a bit there. Did you want to um, add to any of that on the, on sort of the, the communication or engagement piece? Any challenges there you're experiencing? Um, well, communication and engagement. I mean, like I've been working in this field for 20 years and uh, it's still the same thing. And I mean, I, I get it. Every, every community is like that. There's things that are a different priority, right? Okay, so there's like education is a different priority. Uh, the water system treatment plant is a different priority. Um, connectivity fits in there. It's almost the underlying base for all of those things nowadays, but it hasn't really been a priority until this year. And it was COVID that started showing everybody how much of a base that is, that connectivity, right? It underlies uh, health, education, the administration, child and family, everything like that, right? So I'm hoping that people will start seeing that and lobbying for it to become a higher priority within funding agreements and stuff like that, right? Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Ron, I just wanted to ask you, because I remember um, you, were, you were saying a few minutes ago about some of your engagement with the city of Edmonton, for example. Um, you know, anything, uh, any advice from, from that experience or, or, could you, or just generally speaking on the engagement side or communication side? It, really, all they have to offer is support. And uh, it, it's, it's, the, um, it's those telco providers that we're trying to get um, on our site to help us with what we need to do to be connected. Um, you know, going back to what Penny Uncle was saying that we, we really aren't um, advanced, ad advancing the, the, uh, the, the supports that we, we are needing in this regard as quick as, as it needs to happen. And, um, you know, we, with the support from the city of Edmonton, um, you know, that can help to leverage a little bit of pressure, but it's all political at this point. Um, you know, I, I was thinking back to the, the comment about uh, the telcos. Uh, we, I guess it was actually the very first uh, year that I got into this position and recognized that we were so far behind and lacking on our contact, contact, contactivity, connectivity, sorry, um, that I approached all the major providers and I said, why don't you do this for us? Or why can't you do this for us? So if we buy you a tower, why can't you put it out here for us? And they said, it's just not economically viable. Uh, we don't have the, uh, the, num the number of residents uh, that they feel is, is important for them to make it a good business case. And I challenged that because we have more people here at Enoch than they do outside of our borders in Parkland County, yet they have a tower there. So that, that argument was really um, uh, not making a lot of sense to me. There was a, this or something else going on. But you know, once we started um, saying, oh, well, we, we've got you know, half a million dollars that we were, we're, we're gonna use to put our own uh, fiber into the, the community, well, they were more than willing to come in and, and put it in for us and, uh, and uh, not allow us to own it. Uh, which I heard the previous speaker say in, in their county that uh, they uh, were, were kind of facing the same challenge that they didn't actually own the, in, the infrastructure, which doesn't make sense. You, you pay for that and you don't own it. Why would you do that? So we ended up getting, uh, getting our own fi dark fiber put in. And uh, now it's been a few years. Uh, they're actually, the, the, the major providers are coming back to us and saying, oh, uh, we figured out a way that we can actually um, rent space on your, on your fiber to provide our services to your residents and your businesses. Thanks a lot, guys. 
<laughs> we, we really needed that help a few years ago and suddenly now you're coming to the table, but you know, not to turn away anything, it, it's, it's starting to evolve a little bit. It's, it's just uh, glacial when it comes to these things and the speed of, of getting things done for, for our community. Uh, we're gonna be well past uh, this COVID challenge and uh, you know, hopefully things will be back to normal uh, and, and the whole issue will, will somewhat slow down a little bit, but we'll always look forward to putting these services in place for our residents because they need it in order to access uh, other services, like you mentioned, the, the telehealth, health, the, um, the virtual health network that uh, I think TELUS calls it uh, Babylon. Um, you know, we don't have access to that because we don't have the connectivity for it. So um, we're challenged with not only not having infrastructure for uh, communications, but we don't even have the proper infrastructure for roads. And, you know, I heard other communities, roads is maybe one of their priorities. Well, the same for us, but we, we can't get money for our roads. So it, it's just a, it's a, it's just a constant cycle of uh, all these challenges and, and they each kind of play against each other. So if people need to go into the city or into uh, Spruce Grove or Stony Plain for uh, health services, they're at the, the mercy of, uh, you know, family sometimes that might have a vehicle or, or um, you know, maybe the health services can schedule a ride for them to go in, but it's not like as convenient as, as a lot of other community members would have. So I'll, uh, I, can, I can continue on for a long time, but we don't have a long time, do we? <laughs> no, that's, Thank you. Um, actually, I was looking at Penny too as you were talking, and I was wondering, Penny, if you could speak to, you know, KNet having, you know, 20 years of experience in terms of being involved in building the infrastructure side. And I think Ron raised a really good point of, you know, how do communities and regions balance off, um, you know, road infrastructure versus, you know, different connectivity, that kind of thing. Of course, there's limited funds available and and I'm just wondering from your experience there, whether a lot of communities may maybe only have winter roads, fly in access a lot of the year. Um, how do you deal with this kind of challenge? So, yeah, so from the beginning, like the goal, um, so I think, so I'll go back to the late nineties. So very quickly, uh, the way we understood, we learned about broadband was uh, we're a small tribal council of uh, six First Nations in, uh, Northwest Ontario, the chiefs and staff got on a bus and went to Ottawa, which is like a 25 hour bus ride. Uh, we went to different uh, agencies and government, but we also went to the Heart Institute where the chiefs saw telemedicine for the first time. And it's like, why don't we have this? And so when we came back, us technicians started working and planning about, about broad, you know, first, what is broadband? What needs to be done? And then that's why we first, uh, then Bell, you know, met with Bell, they wouldn't do it. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, it, 20 years kind of went a bit fast, I guess, because when we started, we just had T1 technology. So that's 1.5 megs that go to a uh, point of presence and shared over a cable plant. So really at that time, people, you know, maybe one computer in a, in a couple houses, but not every house and all that. and. Uh, so there wasn't a lot of pressure on the network, but as applications and services develop, you know, there's more demand. Um, communities started buying uh, three or four T1s to get more capacity. So then there's pressure to build uh, fiber to the community. So that kind of happened. So then communities started ordering uh, larger circuits. So they're getting 30 megs and 100 megs, and then um, 200 megs, 500 megs, and then like today, um, I can't upgrade any of the circuits because there's a capacity issue with Bell and, and they won't upgrade their infrastructure um, to provide more capacity. <clears throat> so I think that like basically the, all the development on the network has been built by like the communities themselves. They, the remote communities, they don't really have like an economic base. They don't they don't live in an area where they do taxation or anything like that, or 
So, I mean, the, you know, the revenue coming in is from different government programs uh, and then the casino, they belong to a casino Rama. So, <clears throat> so I mean, to, for them to invest in their own broadband infrastructure, um, that they really don't have the resources to do that. So everything is developed based on writing proposals to government agencies. And so really for the first uh, couple of years, it wasn't really direct broadband funding because there was really no pots of funding that were broadband funding. It was all funding from like Health Canada to connect the health center or from school funding or, you know, you just had to be um, unique like Ron mentioned like it, it, it just fits in some other project they might want to get connectivity. Yeah, thanks. I think that's, oh, sorry. Their, sorry, we tend to manage their priorities. But I, I think that's a good, uh, a good point to kind of shift to the solutions, right? The proposals and, and one of those being around funding programs, like what would you, um, what would you like to see from you know, from government, from funding initiatives. Um, maybe Eula, if we could start with you, what would you like to see in terms of solutions? Well, I think in terms of solutions, um, you know, one of the biggest ones is just, uh, you know, like the end point is getting the access to the people, right? Um, I don't know necessarily in some areas, you might not have to reinvent the wheel. Here in Pikani, like I said, we're right along Highway 3. We have the super net here. It's already running into the community. We can we have access points here, uh, pop, pop sites and stuff like that. We also have uh, the large telcos like TELUS uh, has pretty good coverage around here. We have uh, several Wi-Fi vendors uh, that aren't based on the reserve, but they're local ISPs. And, you know, if they're willing to come in and partner with the reserve to provide that service, I think that's a reasonable option as well. I know a lot of other communities wouldn't have that option, but I think here that would be a good idea, right? And I mean, like uh, Arrows here, um, Tough Country Wireless, and there's another one. But anyway, uh, if you could partner with them, to get stuff off the ground and, you know, really look at also, uh, it's, it's based on customer service, right? Who gives you the best customer service? Who has the lowest price point? Are we looking at the band supplying free Wi-Fi out to all the, you know, residences? That would be awesome. But if that's not going to happen, who has, uh, you know, the cheapest plan out there for what we need in the residences at the house? Right. So I think that is something that we should be looking at um, in different communities, especially ones that have access to the supernet. I mean, it's just that last mile of getting, you know, that connectivity onto the reserve. But if there's a pop right there already, you're halfway there. Right. Um, in terms of funding, it would be good to see that funding built in. I mean, I think, you know, maybe even by treaty region. Uh, that was something that we talked about a lot with uh, Spectrum. I mean, if that's, you know, part of a treaty agreement is like, you know, give us access to spectrum. Why are we bidding on spectrum? Why we should be able to just have it allocated to our reserves as part of that treaty process. That funding should come in. If it's almost a basic human right, like clean water, right? So if it underlies everything, they should be providing that funding so that we can step up and build it into our communities. The new housing that's going out there, put that conduit in so at least you can run fiber in the future if you need it, right? So anyway. Thanks. Um, Ron, did you wanna add anything to that in terms of funding, the spectrum aspect of it? Um, no, not too much to that point, but the, you know, with the universal broad, uh, broadband fund that uh, recently came out, um, you know, we, we looked to apply for it and we went through the eligibility uh, process and according to their data, not our data, their data, uh, we weren't eligible because they said that we were fully um, serviced with uh, the 50 mega, megabyte uh, service, which is 100% false. It's, uh, you know, the lines are running along the highways, along the utility corridors, but we don't have access to them. So, you know, the, um, the criteria that they put in place for, and it's a good fund to be putting out, this is what we're asking for, but it's, it's, it's 
setting up some of the communities with um, the inability to access because of false data, false information. So we've uh, we've already written back to the minister on that, but uh, haven't heard um, <laughs> haven't heard anything on it. So anyway, um, it, it, you know, sometimes the the funds themselves are are so restrictive too that it, they make it very difficult to access. Uh, Penny, in terms of this this sort of line of uh, discussion, you know, the the solutions. Um, what would you like to see change? What do you see as some of the solutions there? So before the funding was announced, and they, you know, they do go around and ask um, groups um, about what kind, what should be in the the criteria for the funding. How should it look? So we did it several times. Talked to them about setting aside funding for First Nation uh, communities. Um, that didn't really happen. It has happened in previous uh, funding allocations. Uh, and the reason, like, it's not because I feel that we should have our fair share, but I mean, it's the reason is like their First Nations are not served by connectivity and like we are a big group and and we are connected uniquely in some cases, like in the North, like we're not connected, like we, we buy Bell, um, Bell circuits, but we bring our, you know, we bring our circuits to uh, Toronto and we buy Bulgate, like we manage their circuits ourselves and provide services and we interconnect and that's how we deliver telemedicine and, and telejustice and all other services. Like we're a First Nation network and we've been able to do that. And so, you know, we want, we have our presence now in the North. So we want to continue that and the first, and we want to continue to support the community networks. And so, you know, we that is why, you know, we think it's important that we have separate funding that we're applying to that some of the criteria doesn't really fit um, us when we apply. Yeah, I think that's a really important point around the criteria. And as you say, it ties into the unique circumstances and the diverse circumstances in communities. And also the question of, I don't even like the term business model, but sort of operational model. Um, and does anyone want to speak to that? Um, just, I know uh, Yuli talked about partnerships, um, for example, but um, you know, do you want to speak to anything in terms of how, like, is there a match there between policy, funding, business model requirements? Do you want to speak at all to that in terms of the, the operational model? Well, and I think that's really important, uh, looking at the operational model. I mean, in, in some cases, you might not necessarily want a business model, right, on reserve and stuff like that. Like I was saying, if you're looking at it being a service, just like the water service, right, on the reserve or the garbage service or whatever else like that, then it becomes a service and it might not necessarily bring in any money, like profits and stuff like that. So that's something that you have to be looking at. I know my whole thing was trying to get Wi-Fi out for free to our community. And we did that for probably about seven years there for just the town site itself, which was great, right? But then, you know, um, things move on and we couldn't, you know, you always have to budget in the equipment and that's where it falls down, right? If, if you're just doing it for free, how do you get money to upkeep that equipment to keep it, you know, evolving as you need it to? So there's, there's that. So it's not a business model, you're right, but it's planning, it's organization, and then it's also lobbying. A lot of it is lobbying. A lot of it's lo lobbying, uh, you know, the federal government to fulfill funding obligations that you think are necessary, you know, on your on your reserve or for all indigenous communities actually within Canada. So. Thank you. Um, Ron, did you wanna to add to that at all? Yeah, the, uh, the business case for indiv individual communities just doesn't uh, add up. So it's really difficult to do that on a business model, but. The, jo the joint venture idea is actually one that I'm starting to get some more information from some colleagues down at the UFC and uh, a few others that are out there. And uh, there's some communities out in Ontario that are working with a, um, a network provider to do a joint venture. And I, I'm curious what their model looks like uh, to see how that works for them. And it might be just a social model like you were saying is, you know, you, 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 you can do it, you know, to a certain degree of cost, but it, it, you can't really um, 
charge back to your community members the, the true cost for providing that. If we were to run fiber to every house out in the, uh, in the community, and we're only a four by five mile box, um, it would cost us uh, you know, uh, over $10 million to run all those lines. You can't possibly recover that from your nation members who are you know, not, not capable of paying uh, even what the current providers are, are charging. So it's a, it's a real tough um, rock and a hard place. So I'm curious to find out, you know, as I learn more um, about this, I'm not a, uh, a technical person at all. This is not my space. Like uh, you folks are in it for 20 years. I, I envy you and the knowledge you have. I need to reach out to people like you and, and, and learn more from, from you and, and those other colleagues that I'm that I, um, getting information from, like at the U of C. I, I really need to, to get more of this going and to get this dialogue going. And, and so thank you for this, uh, this venue too, to do that. Thank you, yeah. Um, and I did wanna pick up what you were saying around, um, you know, sort of the differential operational models there and especially the cost of doing things like rolling out fiber and I wanted to ask Penny because I know Penny you work with some very remote fly-in communities imagine the cost is quite high um, you know somewhere like Fort Severn right northernmost community in Ontario have connectivity up there I know it's by by C-band satellite but how did you go about doing that work what was some of the arguments made how did you position that for, for policymakers? <laughs> that's many moons ago <laughs> yeah so that that definitely like I was just sort of starting when that was all happening uh, within broadband so um, my um, predecessor Brian Beaton like he definitely uh, rattled a lot of phone calls to different government agencies a lot of it was trial and error like we didn't just do c-band like there's all kinds of other satellite providers that they tried out combining different satellite providers like I think at the time like in the in the early uh, 2000s that you know the the services were changing new providers were coming on board and then they did finally settle on c-band but it definitely costly like it's dishes uh, they get how uh, there is only a winter road short winter road season when equipment like because you can't really fly and equipment is very expensive. Uh, Fort Severn, the other way to get stuff in is on a winter barge that comes along the, around to the Hudson Bay uh, coast. So that's other ways of getting equipment in. Um, and that, like, and there's other challenges, like now that they have infrastructure, like in the last 20 years and all in 20 of these communities, um, like, like they're building new houses and so they want those houses connected. And so they wanna, you know, uh, expand their cable plant. I mean, the, all those challenges in doing that because you need to like if it's Ontario Hydro telephone poles or bell po phones poles, you have to get them engineered and then your yeah, report goes to Bell and then Bell tells you if you have to replace any poles, so then that adds onto the cost of you know connecting new homes and so yeah so I think like day to day and trying to expand your business within a community there's a lot of cost to that. And like what Yola said, like the equipment, like when you, your equipment only lasts five to seven years and then you have to, you know, every green it and buy new equipment. Or if you move from like a, like a 10 meg circuit to a hundred meg circuit to one gig circuit, you have to buy new equipment every time you upgrade. So, you know, there's an added cost to that. And, and now we're looking at 10 gig circuits for our communities. And I mean, the equipment just gets bigger and more expensive and, yeah, so you have to figure out, you know, what is that uh, break even point and can we afford to do that? But at the same time, you have the government in your year like 5010 by whatever that date is and <laughs> to every home in Canada. So you're trying to meet that target and you're thinking the government's there with you, but definitely that's the biggest challenge. You can plan it, but it might end up costing millions and millions of dollars. And if you can't get the government to fund, then you can't get 5010 to the home. No, thanks. And I think also you're illustrating that, that it, you know, the increasing demand for the bandwidth all the time too, like it's getting used and there's demand for higher speeds all the time as well. So it's kind of like catching up, but of course there's cost involved in scaling up. Um, 
but yeah, I saw some discussion in the chat actually around that, like sort of the 5010 standards and then the ways that broadband gets um, regulated with respect to the service that should be available to everybody. Um, do any of you have comments on that? Maybe um, I'll start with Eula, like just in terms of that 5010 standard. Does that address the needs in your communities? Um, yeah, I think so. Well, for education and stuff like this, like, I mean, what Ron was talking about, meetings like this on Zoom, right? I mean, if everything's going based off of uh, Google Meet meetings, Zoom meetings, other meetings like that, Skype and stuff like that, yeah, you know, we're, we're those standards as a minimum, right? So. Ron, did you, thank you. Um, did you want to speak to that at all, the, the CRTC standard? No, I can't actually. <laughs> I don't understand that technical level, but you know, just just the minimum would be would be nice to have, uh, which we're working towards. But um, when you mentioned the chat room, I turned it on, and there's a lot of chat there. Are we going to have opportunity to answer those questions that I'm sorry I missed? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Is there's one more that I just wanted to ask the group, and then we could spend the last 15, 20 minutes or so just turning to the Q and A from the audience. And this is just around the, um, I suppose the indigenous ISPs approach, which all of you have uh, experience with in different ways. And I just wanna ask you all, maybe starting with Penny, um, what supports are required to support um, indigenous ISPs? I think it's the community, you know, it has to be like at the chief and council level that, uh, you know, there's buy-in to support your local network. Like you, because the model is you do have to charge the end customer, so the home. So, I mean, if we're, we're, we bring the circuit into the community to a pop, so there's a cost to that, that we build a community, but then they have to build the homes um, to, you know, to get the money to pay the circuit. But if the community, so if they don't have that uh, chief and council and the community on board to do that, then bills, you know, people won't pay their bills or, you know, so they need to have that support. So they know that if they're gonna say, well, if you don't pay, we're gonna cut you off on this date, that, that they can do that. So that's important, I think. And the other thing that's important to, and I probably to all the local ISPs or smaller ISPs is have those anchor tenants, like the health center and the school and the, and the uh, community buildings. Because, yeah, so having the bigger tenants helps reduce the cost to the end customer. Thank you. Um, Ron, did you want to comment on that? Supports for community networks? Yeah, it's more on an equity base. Um, you know, we don't have access to the markets to um, get loans to do these kinds of infrastructures. We don't have, um, like uh, you were saying earlier, uh, um, you know, the tax base or, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, ex not a huge uh, economic base to, to draw on. So, you know, it would, it would be a huge burden uh, for individual homeowners to try to pay for this because uh, you can only go so far as a social program. And, um, you know, it, it still is going to cost the community the money to, to do this. It's just, there's no way around it. So um, yeah, that's that's a barrier for us for sure. Thanks, and then Eula, any last thoughts, and then we'll turn to the Q and A uh, session. Um, well, just in terms of like if it's a indigenous owned ISP, um, I think it's just like any other ISP. You need to provide what you promise to provide in a timely manner and you need to have good customer service, right? And, and I think Penny's right. It needs to have community buy-in and it needs to have that political support within the community. If, if any of those legs are missing, it won't work, right? It just won't. Um, but I mean, I think that's the same for any small community ISP out there, uh, indigenous or not, right? So. Yeah, thank you very much, great. Um, so turning to the questions, so just to the audience, if you have any questions, we'll try to get to them. Um, and I'll start with uh, maybe David's, um, would there be any value? So 
and, and whoever wants to answer, just put up your hand since there's three of you. So would there be any value for training local community members in network technology and servicing such as fiber splicing, testing or provisioning? Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I'll answer that. So yeah, in our case, like in the North, like the local technicians are key to running the network like, because we can't afford, like it, it definitely would not work to, every time there's an issue that we charter into a community, like it's just too costly. So having trained technicians that understand their local infrastructure has been key to, to running the networks. Thanks. Okay, thanks. And I was just pausing in case, so if anybody else wants to answer, just put up your hand or unmute yourself. Um, I did see one directed at Ron uh, from Kathy about what joint venture in Ontario are you referring to? Actually, that's one of the ones I saw right away. And it was the one just before her comment. Um, it, it's um, it's, a, it's a, actually a band in uh, uh, Manitoba. So I was mistold or understood that it was in Ontario. But Long Plain, First Nation uh, and Mage Network uh, formed this joint venture. So that's one that I had not heard of. Um, I, I looked at the technology, I looked at the website, it's um, point to point, but it's, 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 it's got uh, some interesting uh, aspects about how they, they do that uh, off the uh, pop. They can, they can transmit the, the signal down the line up to four, uh, I think on the, on the video they were doing it at four kilometer intervals. And um, I don't know technically how much signal loss there is over that period. But you know that's something I'm going to look into for sure once I uh, uh, get off of uh, this call because um, I just learned about it uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, from somebody at UC. So um, these are things that First Nations need to be aware of. Um, you know the, the 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 technology of fiber is fantastic. When it first came in place, I think I was. Uh, in 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 my early early years of uh, university, and it was a, a new concept that uh, you could send signals down these fibers of glass of silica. It was it was beyond me. It sounded like uh, science fiction. So now there here's a new uh, technology disruptor that's coming uh, down the pipe, and those are the things. I think as First Nations, we need to be aware of and we need to be able to take advantage of those when they come forward, not to just be handed old technology, hand-me-down technologies, but to you know maybe be on the forefront of these technologies and to be the communities that demonstrate the, the capabilities and the capacities of those. I think that's where we, we need to move towards. Thank you. Um... Euler, Penny, did you want to comment at all on the joint venture? Um, any any good examples of, of joint ventures or not? Okay. Okay, so there was a question there around um, sort of incentives for business, you know, um, write-offs, that kind of thing. Um, did anyone want to comment on that? Write-offs for investing in infrastructure of the nation to better our level of, of living? Yeah. Um, I think that would be a really good idea. I mean, like, you know, if you could get TELUS to come in and run fiber in our community and give them a write off for it, you know, maybe they would. Uh, um, Ron was saying, you know, their community and how much it would cost, but we're quite large down here and we have a lot of rural customers. So say running fiber from the pop to my house, that's almost like a three mile run, right? So, you know, if you're gonna do that, I don't know, maybe those big telecos would go for a tax break like that. Who knows, you know? But then it comes back down to ownership of that infrastructure. Who's gonna own it at the end of the day? Is the band gonna own it? Or is that big teleco gonna own it, right? If it's on reserve property, who does it really belong to? Who should it really belong to, I guess, at the end of the day? So lots of aspects to that particular question. Okay, thanks. And I'm just kind of scanning through the chat in case people have other questions. Um, so some of these are just popping up as we're talking. Um, just give me a moment. So there's the standards question about the CRTC. That's not all I was. 
there's been a lot of comments here, so that's great. Do, do any of you have experience with um, groups like the, the Infrastructure Bank of Canada, for example? So not so much the funding programs, but any of those kind of financing initiatives? No, okay. I talked to them, but they are looking for uh, bigger projects. So bigger than like maybe 30 million, 60 million. Okay, so not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, I did also want to mention the wireless aspects in Spectrum. So I know that uh, your group, Penny, has has done some work there around uh, mo mobile services as well through K Mobile. Um, did you want to speak to that at all, like sort of like the cellular aspects, and how did you uh, get? Sure, there? sure. So for the last. Uh... 10 years or so, we have been delivering uh, cellular to 25 remote communities. So these are, again, in areas where no other cellular company was delivering or going to deliver service. So we were, um, the spectrum that we use is actually Rogers Spectrum. So we have an agreement with them to use the spectrum. <clears throat> right now, there's no charge for it. Uh, because they're, they're not using it and they don't have a plan, so they can't, I guess they don't bill us for that. Um, and yeah, so, but, so it's our own cellular company. We have uh, roaming agreements with uh, T-Baytel, which is Thunder Bay uh, Mobility and uh, Rogers, uh, just so when people travel out, they can uh, use their phones. But again, it's, a, it's another, um, so, you know, it, it is expensive to maintain if we're upgrade, continuing need to, to upgrade the equipment when it, we have to evergreen it. And so, yeah, so you need that long-term plan. So thank you for, for that. So I guess, um, yeah, just turn into the chat again. I'm not seeing any more questions for the panel. So I'll just give you each uh, a chance for final comments. Um, anything else you'd, you'd like to uh, share with the audience here, maybe starting with Eula. Um, well, I guess final comments and stuff like that. I think um, it, it's coming to a crossroads what we need and the political will that we need to expend to get what we need. Right. Uh, I talked about touched on a little bit before uh, the will of chief and council. If it's behind that technology, if it understands the need for that, that that connectivity within the community itself, will they lobby the federal government? And is that you know, I think it ties right into treaty rights. I mean, if it's coming down to you know access to information, just like access to clean water, access to housing and education, all of that is under underpinned by our connectivity and our communication abilities, right? So I think that that's one thing that maybe we have to start um, looking at organizing and lobbying for a lot harder on the federal level for that funding to be allocated, maybe separately, you know, but maybe all in one big chunk, but, you know, to come in and, you know, to put that fiber in our communities, to give us that infrastructure so at least we can go about figuring out how to, you know, provide connectivity on that infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Ron. Well, oh, there it goes. Um, yeah, the, you know, that, that conversation about treaty, um, that's come up a number of times and how this fits into it. And I do believe it is part of that, that discussion and our, our uh, leaders need to be having that on a very serious uh, level with the, the federal government. Um, you know, the, the federal policy needs to change. They talk, they talk about uh, the clean water and you see how challenged they are about delivering that to our communities. Um, and, you know, the same goes for uh, communications and not just uh, internet, it's, it, you know, it, it's really even cell phone. Uh, a lot of homes don't have um, home phones. Uh, they, they rely on their cells. And, um, you know, having, having a reliable connection to emergency services or to uh, um, medical uh, advice or, 
or any of that, just like we take advantage, uh, you know, we, we, we take for granted here, uh, I live in the city and uh, I, you know, I, I, I feel like um, it's an unfair advantage to be living here, yet my mom lives in the nation and she can't get reasonable cell phone coverage to, you know, to call out, to phone, um, you know, and for me to call her when I need to. But, um, you know, even when I'm in my office out at the nation, I'm in a dead zone in my office because the band office was made of brick back in the 1980s. And the cell service is so weak that my office is a dead zone. So I miss all kinds of calls all the time. So uh, send me an email. Don't phone me. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, thank you, Eula, for bringing that up, because that is an important part of the discussion, is how does that work uh, fit into the, the, the treaty talks. And, you know, if uh, anybody wants to reach out to me later, Rob, can you share our contact information? Sure. Yeah, I would actually, why don't, um, as Penny's like kind of wrapping up, why don't you everybody just type in the chat like your contact information and i'll just uh pass it on to uh to penny for, oh, if you did want to share it sorry in the chat otherwise absolutely people can uh, email me and i could pass it on as well um and penny any final thoughts for the panel sure as i read the chat as it pops up <laughs> so, so uh i guess um from the late 90s to now like it, it really did go fast. And um, like, I mean, at first it was really to bring service, like the goal of broad, like it wasn't to build broadband. The goal was to really to bring the services that uh, main, some mainstream communities are, were already receiving to our communities. So our communities could have better healthcare and better education. Like, so like we built broadband you know, really to be, to bring those services to our community. And uh, and now like Ron has mentioned, like people want cellular, so they have, you know, they can, in, uh, you know, uh, find their kids when they're past curfew or, you know, just for the safety of the community. If someone's out cutting wood that, and, you know, they get in an accident, they can reach, like, you know, things things happen. And uh, yeah, so it's all, it's really about, um, providing the service, better service and to our community members and, and having it available for our community members. And yeah, initially it was, you know, we were just looking at, you know, it was 64K dial up and then it was, uh, you know, 1.5 megs and then 10 megs and then 30 megs and now one gig circuit. And now, you know, our communities of, you know, 400 to 1,000 people, they're looking at 10 gig circuits. like. The demand is there for the in the houses, you know. Every you know, before there was barely one computer in the house. Now there's several devices in each house. You know, people are doing Zoom meetings and uh, kids are in school on Google Meet, and so that, that bandwidth it's no longer um, just a benefit; it's an essential service. And and yeah, I think we really like are we're at the point where we have to continue to educate our leadership um, locally and nationally, and and just and, and our government agencies. And yeah, it's good that there's broadband um, funding available, but will that meet the needs today to get 5010 to everyone in Canada? Probably not. So I think there's still so an uphill battle for First Nations in rural areas in Canada. But sounds like there's a lot of good people on this call. And so I think there's the drive to do it. So uh, good luck, everyone. <laughs>